parents always say, each time you come back from an expedition with everything that you've faced, we expect you to come back slightly changed, your spirit slightly darker. But there's no way I would have known I would have caught the deadliest strain of malaria. I would have been held up at gunpoint. I would have avoided the bandits. I would have been bitten by spiders and leeches, crossing crocodile infested rivers. We'll have to hover the helicopter and physically jump into the river covered in piranha. And then from there, we then need to navigate to find the source, true exploration. And if we're successful, we need to map it. This is it, I'm going to die in the Gobi Desert. But there was something else internally that made me focus on the only option that I had, which was to survive. Dying's going to happen anyway if I don't do anything about it. The only thing that I can do is survive. Yeah, okay. Thank Thanks. you. Nice yeah, not in the normal studio. So we thought, obviously, we've got such an explorer here, Ash. We thought we'd repay the favour and do a little bit of travelling ourselves. Yeah, so we, we brought it down to London. Lads. Yeah, we've come from train. Notts today. How today. long did that yeah. take? Two... You booked the train. So there yeah. was the wrong train. Oh, no. <laughs> and, it, and then we also missed the first one. But yeah, we don't, oh, don't want to. And really then it defend. was a different podcast studio, wasn't it? So it's been. Yeah. It has been an adventure this yeah. morning for you. I'm yeah. sure you've. Uh, you're no uh, stranger to an adventure, are you, Ash? Exactly. So. If you want to give us a bit of a background on yourselves, obviously yeah. we know who you are, and I'm yeah. sure hopefully the people listening are, but like some of the things you've done. Yeah, man. How long do you want it to be? A minute, uh, five well, minutes? How long we got? <laughs> start from the start. Where from were, the start. Where were you born for so, the people at home? North Wales. Yeah. A little a little coastal town called Old Colwyn. Very sleepy place, you know, not an awful lot happening there whatsoever. Yeah. Um, and I, again, very normal background, normal upbringing, sort of, I no financial upbringing, no university, no Brothers military background. Younger brother, older sister, um, and then after my high school in Uskol Brynellion, I went straight to college to do a two-year national diploma in outdoor education. During those two years, whilst I was doing sort of winter mountaineering, avalanche awareness, rock climbing, gaining lots of skills and qualifications, which I really liked. I was also working in a fish shop, a uh, fish and chip shop as a lifeguard, as a waiter, saving funds. And it was during these two years I was saving funds because I didn't really know what I wanted to do. All the rest of the students were either going to go to university to get their degree in outdoor education or sports science or, or join the military. And during those two years of college, I was just like, I don't want either of those. But back then, 2008, 2009, you kind of need a, a direction, you know, and this careers advisor gives you a few options. It's like eight, 10 options. I'm like, really? This massive world, there's only eight potential jobs or career paths I can take. So I just knew that there was more out there in the, in the sort of big wide world. And I had this fascination with leaving the UK behind, leaving these sort of traditional old school career paths, going out to the world, learning about the world about myself, different cultures, different traditions. I had this thought of facing adversity as I'm young, you know, the more you face, the more you're able to handle. Um, and collecting experiences, you know, from a young age, I've always known that I reckon this life goes really fast. We only get this one life. How do I want to live it? By the end of my days, will I look back and regret that I didn't do the things or will I look back and think, thank God, I just took that leap of faith and just went against what the norm is, against what all of my peers were saying. Because they said, you'll go off and travel and you'll end up coming back to square one because you would have run out of money in Thailand, Australia, wherever. We would have moved on with our lives, with our careers, have degrees, master's degrees to our name, be settled with our girlfriend, maybe kids, and you'll have to start from scratch. And there was some truth to that as well. So I thought if I'm going to do this, I need to do it in a very smart way. I need to be clever about this, not just like a gap year. And then anyway, kind of a very long story short, I set off age 19. And from that point, I started to do a lot of adventures, dangerous, reckless, illegal. They start to expand bigger and better, you know, learning how to survive in the jungle with the Burmese hill tribe, sort of crossing into the border from Thailand to Myanmar illegally, crossing the border of India and Pakistan, where the military from Pakistan sort of border with no permit cycling Cambodia and Vietnam on 10 pound bicycles, hitchhiking across Australia, cycling across Australia before then settling as a Muay Thai fighter 
and a scuba diving instructor in Thailand for two years. And this is all just before the career that I'm living now kicked off, which was the first world record with Mongolia, which led on to everything that I achieved after that. So there's a lot to it before. So the, the fascination for exploring was always there yeah and i think it's one of those that we do face in the uk you have so a lot of people have this dying urge to pursue this passion yet we get this education system that says this is what you'll do black and white blah 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 and you luckily you've broken away from it and you've monetized what you loved which is amazing but yeah obviously it, it took a long time to uh, to get to where you are the mongolia that's 2014 Yes. So it, between 19 and then, it was a good few years. Yeah, it was It was four four years. I set off 2010, um, was doing a lot of traveling, gaining different qualifications, then obviously settling for a couple of years Thailand. And then when Mongolia happened, I kind of thought maybe, maybe after Mongolia, that will be the one where I can monetize. Maybe there's going to be sort of some sort of career because it's a world first and a world first for me is like a gold medal in the Olympics. I kind of thought if I achieve that, surely there's, but it, it, I was wrong. It wasn't the case. It was very hard. You know, I can admit now because it's in the past, but I made no more than 3000 pound in 12 months. I had to stay living with my parents in Wales. Um, I had to really sort of grind, I had to pursue another another adventure. Luckily, I found another world first record. Very hard to find nowadays. And I just had to keep going. Even after Madagascar, maybe it was a £12,000 year. I was now 26. I was like, can I, this is, this is hard. How can you turn your passion into a career? How can you be paid? To, and that, for me, that's what I felt I was the best at. And I had bills. So a lot of people say, is this your day job? It's like, yes. Like they say, why do you go out on these adventures? It's like, because same as why you guys work, we've all got bills to pay, you know? Yeah. And that is, that's my job. That's what, what I feel is What was the underlying sort of fire within though that made you what really want to not settle for your standard job, let's say, and you wanted to go out and experience the world? What, what was driving you to do that? Um, I think a number of things. I would say it was stories from people of, going out, venturing. I would always see it as when people would tell their stories, the thing that always hit me was the stories of these people going to these countries that I'm completely unfamiliar with, gaining experiences that I felt I probably will never experience, but it's out there to be experienced. It's out there to be had. Mm. But also of the perspective of looking into that person's eyes as they're telling me all of these crazy stories, thinking, how has that changed them? What did that do to them? Has it scored them? Has it made them tougher? Could they now face most things today that do go wrong and face it much better than how a lot of people would? Would They would panic, that shock of capture, you know, that fight or flight, mm. and most choose to flight. But, um, and so I was kind of like, you know, I wonder what it would feel like to face such crazy experiences, live to tell the tale. What would that do to you as a person? And then after that, when you do face typical shit that everyone faces during the day where you handle it better because you've been to the real sort of dark depths um, mentally, psychologically, you know, physically. Do you think it has? I think so, but in a very positive way. My parents always say each time you come back from an expedition with everything that you've faced, we expect you to come back slightly changed, you know, your spirit slightly darker. Um, maybe even PTSD, but there's been none of that. If anything, I come back with more enthusiasm, more eager to, and I've seen a lot. I've seen a lot of horrific things. I've faced a lot. I've almost died a number of times, but I think it's the mental preparation that stops me going down that dark spiral. I've, I'm expecting these to happen. And of course, I'm. no one's got a gun to my head saying, you've got to do this. I'm voluntarily doing these, these expeditions. So I think my mind appreciates the positives and puts them on the pedestal more than the negatives. So when I come back from an expedition that almost killed me, I almost forget the fact that it almost killed me. And I think of the highlights, like the locals or the sunsets mm -hmm. and all of these great things that happened and achieving the record and what I learned during the process, who I met. Um, and then, of course, you are rewarded because you come back and then you're kind of like, oh, this is a difficult career. But then you get a glimpse of something interesting. You know, you're kind of like, oh, well, it could be the TEDx talk or it could be a book publish or it could be 
you know, a very well paid talk or could be brand ambassador for someone that you never expect to, to work with. Jaguar Land Rover being one who I was ambassador for. Unreal. So when things go really bad, you kind of like, you don't know what's around the next corner. Because I remember being in a dark stage and thinking, oh God, you know, what, what am I going to do next? And then all of a sudden Jaguar Land Rover are calling for me to be ambassador, global ambassador. And I'm like, could have never have predicted that whatsoever. So I think what also keeps me on this career path is the fact that I just don't know what's coming next. And it, mm. that's, that feeling is probably quite that's what addictive. Drives you. Yeah. And then the more of this sort of cool stuff that I do, and I do love doing it anyway, I know, well, something's going to happen. So yeah, I might suffer for a little bit or it might be, I might be regretting it, some aspects of the expedition whilst I'm out there, but I think it's in my DNA. So I think I've always been fascinated and curious about the world, watching shows like David Attenborough shows, not wanting to watch it, but wanting to be out there amongst mm. this nature, amongst the wildlife. Um, and, but my granddad's a crazy man as well. So maybe it's genetics. Maybe it's in my DNA. I've only met him like five times, but he's a, he's a wild man, a very poor man. Lived in Pakistan for 21 years, overstayed his visa by 15 years, got kicked out of the country, now lives in India on someone's roof because it's a flat roof. So we've built like a wooden shed. Um, and I know that he's got some mad stories of survival and that I probably, I don't know the half of them, but maybe it skipped a generation and maybe it's in my blood. So Who knows? So I don't really know where I get it from. There's a lot. So there's loads and loads of things that come into yeah. it, but obviously you've got to have a very strong like, mental frame in going into it. You've got to set yourself up for it. Are you like consciously doing things to prepare yourself for it? Or is it you're just passing by going, yeah, I know I'm going to be okay. I'm not going to be mentally okay. I'm not going to focus on the negatives or are you doing that like like meditations or things like that obviously there's the mental and physical side of it so maybe start on the mental side of things and mm. then we'll go on to the physical side of things yeah sure yeah the mental is massive i always say it's 70 percent mental 30 percent physical and i before mongolia because mongolia was the first people said you know we can see you physically training for it but how do you mentally prepare for this and i always said there's no way to mentally prepare it was only when I was in Mod uh, Mongolia that I realized that I was wrong. I was mentally preparing. And what I believe it was is everything that could go wrong in Mongolia, I was really sort of exaggerating in my head. I was like, if there's going to be wolves, expect to be attacked. If there's going to be blizzards, expect them to be the expect biggest. Expect the worst. Expect the worst. Because if worst case scenario is unfortunately bound to happen, at least you're somewhat mentally prepared mm. because it comes as something you anticipated. Whereas I think, like, if you think of the typical daily things that happens to people and you see people, like, in shock or panic or scream, it's because they didn't expect it. They couldn't perceive that happening. But if you tell them someone's around the corner and they're going to, like, jump out on you and go, boo, you're not going to get scared. You're not going to jump. You're going to no. expect them to be like, I knew you were there. So that's how it kind of happened on these expeditions. Malaria, I knew you were there. The Gobi Desert, I knew that this could be a thing. Wolves, I knew that you would come at me. You know, so, and I never knew that until I was in Mongolia and Mongolia was the one that I was shitting myself for because people had tried uh, in the past, a, a soldier had attempted three times, looked like Jason Statham, badass, sorry about that. Um, and so, you know, these people were trying it. I was like, what, what chance do I have being a beach bum Muay Thai fighter who has never been to, an, uh, to a desert before, who lives on an island, you know? So I was very scared mentally. But um, that's how I would prepare. It's like physically expecting worst case. So the, Mongolia then, how, how long was that? That was a 1,500 mile journey that took 78 days. And to sort of break that down, that's three weeks over the Altai Mountains, five weeks across the Gobi Desert, and a further three weeks up through the Mongolian steppe. Uh, completely solo. And unsupported. And when I say completely solo, and some people say solo and unsupported, and there's a van like five miles behind yeah. them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, no tarmac roads, no van, no people other than the locals who I might come across once every eight days. And ins my insurance was invalid because in the country of Mongolia, you can't find insurance that covers someone who is unsupported. So, and my evacuation, unlike the previous guy who had a helicopter evac, I couldn't afford that. I moved back home from Thailand at 23, back to Wales, sold my dive kit. And I remember I moved in with my parents with 200 pounds to my name. Couldn't afford no gym membership. 
had my uncle drop me off a tractor tyre. It's the definition <laughs> of raw dog in life, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 literally, yeah. Is, yes. Yeah. Like, that is raw dog to, to, the, to yeah. a T. That is, it, it is insane, <laughs> but it's so, it just shows that you can do it. It's just taking that first step. Yeah. So what was you breaking it? How was you breaking the journey down? Because obviously you can't, I, I'd hope that you wasn't thinking one, fa- one half thousand miles, yeah. one thousand five hundred. Are you incrementally Yeah, you're it? right. Yeah, not a lot of people think of that, but you're bang on. Uh, you've got to, because that's overwhelming, right? It was anticipated yeah. to take a hundred days. You know, you've got the mountains, the desert, and it, and you're pulling 120 kilograms, which is almost double yeah, you've my got weight. Your kit, haven't you? Which you've is got nuts. everything, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, how can you even fathom a journey of that magnitude, knowing you're doing a marathon a day, pulling Tyson Fury on a trailer, <laughs> effectively yeah, the same yeah. weight, through the hottest and the coldest in cl- uh, climates? And it was, I would break it down by the water points. So the water points would be like little checkpoints. I always said, because everyone said that this trip was impossible. Like even the locals, everyone was deeming, the locals were saying, we've crossed it for thousands of years. We do not go alone because it, it's stupid. They said, we go as a close knit community or we take yak or camel or horses as they have done for thousands upon thousands of years. They would just recommend that I take some sort of donkey. Cause, but then it would be supported the whole world record was solo and so that, that's the key factor here yeah. um, and so lots of people deemed it impossible and I remember looking for that impossible day I went to the Royal Geographic Society with my agent pulled out a map and I said instead of looking at you know f- three weeks five weeks and three weeks the steppe the mountains the desert l- try to break it down into days and I remember actively searching for the impossible day Everyone say it's impossible. Which, which is the day that kills me or breaks me down? Which, yeah. where is it? Missing link Puts me right it. to the yeah, edge, yeah. 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 yeah, if they're going to say it's impossible, I want to hone in and find that impossible day so that I can learn and study of how to overcome that impossible day. And as we went through it, we realized every day is, is possible. Many people have achieved, obviously, much greater things in the past. So this is definitely possible. And after breaking it down, I realized as long as there's water, I can keep going. And so that was the key part was finding the water. Sometimes it'd be two weeks between water sources. Wow. And so I would need to carry, you know, a, a big sort of 20 litre water container, which 20 litres, that's 20 kilograms. Yeah, yeah, know? yeah. And so that was my main aspect was the water points equaled checkpoints, yeah. equaled milestones. Top the health points back mentally. up. Mm. Yeah, yeah. yeah so exactly. So food wise then, yeah. um, one, I imagine... You wasn't spoiled for choice on food, but how, what's the extent <laughs> that you could go without food? Um, I went, I think I did pretty well. People say that's like really bad, that's starvation. But I had a meal a day for a certain aspect of it, which provided me with 800 calories per day. Now, what is it? Don't you need like two and a half two thousand, and a thousand yeah. calories? Good two and a half thousand calories, right? yeah. Just on a daily basis being in an office, for example, nine to five. Yeah, sat there. Yeah. So the fact that I was in the desert, 40 plus degrees Celsius, pulling 18 stone, which felt like 50 stone because the wheels were sinking in the soft sand. Brilliant. 16 hours of walking, probably smashed at least a marathon a day. And I was taking in 800 kilocalories. So I did lose 13 kilograms altogether. No, and I'm not even, I'm not even a big guy. Yeah. So I lost a lot of... Um, I was going to say, was surely just, that had some physiological effects on your body. And- you would, th- Yeah, I, you would think so. I remember speaking to doctors when I came back and they think that because of my youth, because I was only 23, bounced back. Right, yeah, yeah. I got yeah. St- and when I came back, I got straight back on the whole nutrition. I gave myself a little bit of rest. Yeah. When I say a little bit, a couple of weeks before then, I started to try, try to build up this weight, build my body and its strength back up. But... um. Maybe to my, maybe to my organs, you know, I guess we won't know until much further down the Tried line. Out a bit. Were you not even yeah. thinking or, or, or bothered about it? Was it just the end goal in sight and that's all you could see? Yeah. 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 It was that. It was a case of, I kind of knew that maybe I could damage myself, but I think I did also ignore that to a certain aspect as well. Mm. You like you I, have to. Yeah. I think you have to. You can overthink think, it, can't you? Yeah. I think you can overthink it. And I think at that age, I don't know, if, how old are you guys, if you don't mind me asking? 26. 27. 
26 and 27, so you can remember. You were 23, 24. You're invincible. You don't really care, do you? No, <laughs> no for sure. If yeah. someone says, don't box because it will do damage to your brain, you're not going to be like, mm, good shout. I'll do nothing. I'll sit in a bubble for the rest of my life. Yeah. And yeah, then, yeah, that, yeah. And then that, that, that's, that's worse than dying. Yeah. Yeah. It is. You yeah. have killed yourself. Yeah. Haven't you, by default. Mm. Um, and so I never really sort of thought about that. And I was doing a lot of Muay Thai at that time as well in Thailand, sort of beating up my body, sort of getting it ready mentally, physically thinking walking across the desert can't be as bad as like taking punches and kicks. And, you know, so I was kind of mentally saying this will be fine. But I also bet on myself. I was kind of like, I've got this. And I think it, I felt that I had this because I was so scared. I could sit here right now being like, yeah, there's no big problem. I was breaking myself. It sounds like you just didn't give yourself the choice though. Yeah. You just wanted to, I think you have to you give you convince yourself that it's almost like a not not narcissistic, but you think you can do anything to put yeah. yourself into the mindset of because yeah, if you though. if you set your ceiling so high, you will be able to achieve yeah. it. Whereas if you give yourself any shadow of a doubt, yeah, it's not something like that's not going to pull through. It's naivety, yeah, mm -hmm. isn't it? And it's arrogance. Yeah, I remember being I remember flying to the country of Mongolia for the first time ever, never been there before, not even to scout the land that I'll be walking across, and then flying from the capital. Ulaanbaatar to Olgi, the most western city. And I remember being on that plane for hours and Ulaanbaatar isn't even the east of the, it's kind of like center, central east and hours to get to Olgi. Looking down at that land and not seeing tracks, not seeing the little white felt tents and just thinking, oh, what am I doing? What, who am I to come to their country? And try to attempt this when they generationally have been like, no, it's known as stupid and many, many people do and have died. Um, and so there was definitely that fear on the plane. I almost didn't want to look out the plane. I remember like looking and just like, oh, like that. Between your fingers. just like, yeah, close that blind. Because now I could feel the adrenaline kicking in. Now I could, because I didn't know how at that point. Now I know how I handle everything. And that's. I think what I wanted as a 16, 17 year old looking into those people's eyes, telling me the stories, I wanted to be that person who can handle shit. When shit goes wrong, you know, if we were to crash land a plane on an island, I'm, I'm fine. I'm I'll know guy. what to, you know? And I wanted to be that guy. And so right now I've got the evidence, I've got those track habits, I've got the experience and the naivety has been replaced by uh, by evidence, effectively, by the experience. Accomplishments. Yeah. Mm. Whereas flying over to Mongolia on the plane, it was all hope and naivety with a little bit of arrogance because I didn't know how. It's And I've seen it time and time again. When people join me on the expeditions, they're evacuated or they want to bail. They want out. They see Instagram and they're like, oh, that looks pretty. You know, that looks <laughs> nice. They want to join and I'll be naive enough to say yeah come along and then they're evacuated six hours later one mm. day two days almost dying and it's almost with any career your any line of work or hobby or anything that you get good at you almost don't know how far you've come until you see people trying to keep up with any industry and it it's been a big case of that with me on all of these latest trips that mm. i've now had to shut especially the yangtze river when we had 10 evacuated, we just had to shut it down fully. Mm. That, that That's the one where I actually heard about you. And I can't remember if it... Did you do a podcast with Armchair Explorer? Yes. That's the one that I <laughs> yeah. heard. That's the one that I heard uh, okay. ages, ages and ages ago. And I was listening to it and I was thinking... And this is before I'd seen you on Instagram or anything. I was thinking, yeah. this guy's fucking mental. <laughs> I, was, I, this, I was like, this can't be true. And you're getting like followed by wolves. And everything, uh -huh. and then but at the end of it, you're getting followed by all, all the Chinese. Yeah, I was like, this is ace, and this is like probably at least a couple of years before I'd even told you about it. Then I saw you come up on Instagram. I was like, I was looking for. I was like, no, this isn't the guy that did that. <laughs> and and I, I remember like, going on maps, and I was following it down, and I zoomed out, and I was thinking, no, because it is, well, there four thousand miles, yeah. which is long. It's long. massive. If you it? if you were to put that in perspective, like. Do you know how big you, the UK is, top to bottom? How how many times that I is? couldn't even I couldn't even tell you. Let's yeah, pull, let's, I'll pull it up. I think I think I looked how many times you can fit the UK in China because the UK is small. And, yeah, and... I'm, I'm sure I could be wrong. I'm sure it was 75 times you can fit the UK into China. I could be wrong, but I think that was it. 
yeah. So that one was a massive one. But was there like a, a notable point on that Mongolia trip, like the one where you think back to and think, how did I get mentally or physically past that point? Yeah, the Gobi Desert. The Gobi Desert was one where, you know, right now I'm lucky to be here, lucky to be alive. Yeah. Where I, I kind of dehydrated myself over the long haul in the Altai Mountains, unknowingly, because it was cold. I didn't think I needed to drink much water. Entered the Gobi Desert. The temperature changed from like minus 15 in the Altai Mountains to like 40 plus in the desert over the space of like a week, a week and a half of hiking. And I remember trying to ration my water, but I was going through more water because it was hot and I was pulling that trailer. And so I was drinking more than I wanted to, more than I had planned to. And then I started suffering with dehydration, headaches. My eyes were hurting. It was a struggle to get up in the morning. And I continued to push and started to get worse with, with each day. And then it came to a point of being desperate then for water. And I was kind of scared because I was venturing down south of the Gobi Desert, sort of southeast. And I knew that the next water source was on the map, an unconfirmed water source. Oh. Yeah. And Roll that's. The dice. Yeah. What is the temperature? Probably now 40 degrees. This was at the beginning of the, right. the Gobi Desert. And then mid Gobi Desert was plus 40. I don't know exactly. 40. Just like Dubai summer, which is what I can relate to. <laughs> yeah. About 45 degrees is yeah, just too it, hot. You can't like be outside. Hair, like, yeah. like a Like a hair dryer. Yeah. yeah. It, it's kind of like, yeah, picture Dubai beach, mm. the beach on Dubai, the soft sand. With nothing. With, with no nothing, water with, and no sleep and no nothing. Yeah. And then strap a four point harness trailer. Not quite the Palm Dew Maria experience. <laughs> you say. Yeah. You mentioned people were getting sort of airlifted away, people that have tried this before. That was on the last expedition. Yeah, that was the Yangtze. What 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 do people sort of what makes them get airlifted away? Do they just say, I don't want enough? Is it water? Is it tiredness? What you know what? I think a lot of it is mindset. What we talked about to start with, yeah. 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 I think with me, I I really hone in on these expeditions. I know how hard they're going to be. And I kind of have always known as a youngster or when I first sort of had my mind fixed. And you hear st many, many stories of people dying and you don't want to be a statistic. So I take all the preparation extremely serious. And that's probably what the difference is. Right. I think many people don't take it as serious as myself and think mm. that it's only hiking. You know, I can walk. How hard can it really be? And then they join. And when you're hiking amongst bears and you're sleeping in a tent and you hear stories of bears trying to break through steel doors to get into houses of where the locals are hiding in their kitchen cupboards or wolves. Yeah, or wolves <laughs> killing. Starving. Yeah, yeah. And then you've got the altitude and then you've got the authorities. Um, and then you've got the injuries that come with hiking. I mean, it's one thing walking. It's another thing running. Mm. But there's one thing walking or running with a 35 kilogram backpack you just face the pack so you can expect like loads of blisters loads of um, all your nails pretty much coming off at that point but then you've got no shower you've got no guarantee of food no guarantee of shelter and I just think it's that vulnerability and coming out to meet me is that shock of capture and the harsh reality of oh this is actually shit. This mm. is grim. I'll show you this. So th this was the first, hope it loads. This was the first ever hike I did. It's a uh, Helberlin. In yeah. Lake, okay. Oh, look at that. That's and nice. The peak, the peak of winter. Yeah. That's my mate Tom. He's okay. A, he's a nutcase. Not to your level. Uh -huh. Well, that was the first one we'd ever done. And yeah. All, what I can distinctly remember is, yeah. so that was in the peak of winter. There was no one there. We uh -huh. were just in hiking boots and jogger bottoms. And there was people with crampon boots ice picks turning round telling us to turn round he's in my ear going mate we're fine we're fine I'm there going don't think we are but we'll do it and when we got up and we started to descend down the not even before we started to descend the feeling of like the adrenaline just washing out of my body and then as I I, I remember saying to him I, went, I can't get down I can't do it bearing in mind the up was worse than the down and that I just felt empty. So mentally, being able to keep on top of your adrenaline must be another thing because if you're doing that for such a duration of time, that would I can that alone. It it's, must be mentally keeping on top of the adrenaline a hard thing. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's, that's a true. good that's a good example as well. Yeah. And a lot of people, when people join and they've got that adrenaline, they push so hard that they burn out. That yeah. they forget, mm-hmm. oh shit, I've got three I think weeks people left. do think it's a lot easier than it is. Like when we did Scaffold Pike, I thought, oh, piece of piss. We'll go up there. I got halfway up and I was just knackered and I just thought, what, what, you know, I've not hiked. I don't yeah. do, you know, I don't do yeah. things like this normally. So yeah. for, for a novice, it was hard. And yeah. it's not necessarily a hard climb, that, is it no. really? You break mm. through a point, though, I feel like whenever you start them, you get past the point. But I imagine when you're resetting after sleeping, you're going through that whole process again, but drained. Yeah. And drained more and more so every day. And it's that mental resilience to say, we've got to get up and we've got to do it again. Yeah. That's, and how many times did you have to wake up and do that on some of these journeys? 352 times. Well, there you go. <laughs> to, be able, to be able to wake up and go, we're doing this again for a year. Yeah. That's, that's what I think that's the hardest part of it. Yeah. I think we had to wake up this morning at 6 a.m. And I was thinking, God, I've got to, I've got to get a train to London. And a couple of to, tubes. To, to cheers. The, to the empty. <laughs> To the nth degree, that is yeah. infinitely harder. Mm. And, I, and yeah. I do always say that when you're out there, it takes about two weeks to break into what I call your sort of wild side. That's cool. And I think yeah. we've all got it, like for sure, because because of evolution. I think we'll probably lose it in another couple of thousand years. Yeah. Probably. You know, but I think right now we're as close as it gets to sort of primal cavemen. Mm. Because uh, only we're only moving forward, we're only going by the years. We're only sort of everything's getting safer, disconnecting mm. from, especially more of technology um, happening now. But I think after two weeks, we've all got that survival instinct anyway. But there's something that I realised in Mongolia. Actually, when I was 19 with the Burmese Hill Tribe, I remember crossing illegally into Myanmar from Thailand, sort of machete in hand. I was then taken under the wing of a tribal community looking to migrate from Myanmar to Thailand complete language barrier, couldn't speak a word of English. Um, but they were really hospitable. They let us stay there and they were teaching us sort of how to hunt, how to gather uh, sort of berries from the bushes that if you pull them off and rub in your skin, they act as a mosquito repellent, how to build uh, shelter or rafts using natural resources because they were just going about their business. And so I got to experience this. And I remember one night waking up in in my sort of, um, bamboo and banana leaf shelter and my bedding was a banana leaf where it had like a, a ridge either side I remember waking up and seeing leaf cutter ants marching down like right in, like quarter of a foot away half a foot away and I couldn't sleep I was like oh man because I know that there's other venomous there's venomous mm. insects there's snakes there's spiders you know these ants right now although they're minding their own business they're right on me effectively mm. and then I think it was Night three, I remember waking up again and seeing these ants and thinking, they, they don't have no bother with me. Yeah. They're cracking on. I'm in their way. You know, they're not here to get me. They're just using my bed as a mm. shortcut, you know. And I went yeah. back to sleep. And I didn't think of anything at that point. It was only like a week after the jungle where there were certain things in the jungle on my short experience with the community where I was pushed to the point of being very unfamiliar and very uncomfortable that I didn't like. But already after three days, I started to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. I never knew that saying before. But when I did hear that saying like five years later, I was like, I know that feeling. And when you're out there in the wild and you push on for, let's say two weeks, I think it would take me a lot uh, quicker now, probably four or five days because I've experienced it so much. But in Mongolia, I remember it being two weeks where everything just stopped bothering me, where I didn't care about being wet, being necessarily hot, eating bad food, insects, they didn't phase me. Um, and I just became a lot harder. Resilient. Lot yeah. More resilient mm. to, to that specific environment. Mm. What I find interesting as well is with these tribes, um, how often do you see these tribal people depressed or committing suicide and stuff like that. So yeah, it's not, yeah, nature, it's not, it's it? not, a th- it's no. not really a thing, is it? And I no. think it's because we've become so soft and desensitized to life. We'll get so upset by things that to them are just so like, and uh, like not applicable. Yeah. It's, mm. it, and that, uh, that's why I think we do sort of need to get that connection back. That's yeah, we one do. Of the, the major issues I think we experience, especially here in the Western world. Yeah. We get sold this dream of, oh, you, you, you don't have to go through these troubles, blah, blah, blah. 
Yeah. Shelter, shelter, shelter. That's, shelter, that's, yeah. that's yeah. what's actually doing us worse. I think we're we're more disconnected now than we have ever been before. And I think we've almost got so many options and too many opportunities that we've probably become ungrateful. We don't know what we want. We therefore have no purpose. We there question our therefore question our existence. Whereas you've strip it right back to the nomads in Mongolia, for example. They focus on survival. They focus yeah. on what we're going to mm. eat today. They focus on what the weather's doing. How can we best sort of shelter from the weather? You know, and they've got all of this land. They don't know really what's going on outside of them and their close knit family. Maybe their neighbours who are like a day's horseback ride away, and they'll visit them, take some alcohol, have a party, yeah. mm. come back. They've got all of this land. They're not being told what to do, where to go, what can be done. No regulation. No regulation. They wake up when they want to wake up, which is usually based on their livestock. Right. You know, and off they go, they do their job, they come back and they'll have food, drink tea, be with the family. And it's kind of like that for us now, because we're used to such a fast paced life, that would be like really slow and like, yeah. oh God, I need something more. But I do also think that in that environment, you're not going to think about mental health. You're not going to have time to be depressed because you've yeah. got stuff to do and you need to do it. Otherwise you're not going to eat that evening. So then it becomes a little bit more of a fight for survival. You've almost not got time to Whereas, think about the things that don't really matter. Yeah. There's things that matter out there yeah. to keep you alive. Yeah. Whereas I kind of feel really bad for the West because, you know, you see the East and you see, they, well, they very much got it in the East as well, but you see nomads or people who are connected, who live out in nature, in the wild. And it's a very hard life. Don't get me wrong. You know, they face zoods in Mongolia that with the temperature down to minus 40, these great big winter storms. They face great heat out there. They're sort of always out on horseback, no matter what, grinding because they have to. But then you come to the West and you see these people with a great purpose. You come to the West and it's almost like there's a lot of comparison. There's a lot of lost people. You know, the education system has let down a lot of people. I know for me, the education system let me down. I only figured out at age 16 that I was very much a kinesthetic learner. I'd learn through hands-on practical experience. <clears throat> Give me a task. I'll make a mistake, but I'll never make that same mistake twice. Whereas you can teach me not to make that mistake over and over and over and over and again, but I'll still need to do it for myself physically yeah. in order for myself to learn. And I think there's a lot of, especially boys, I think there's a, a lot of young lads who need more sort of physical activities, tasks, hands-on experience. I feel like I can, oh, I can resonate with that. that. Yeah, yeah right. Like that. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I, when I was at school, I did really well academically. Yeah. And I and obviously it's like, oh, you've done so well, blah, blah, blah. Then as you got further on in life, because I didn't struggle in this aspect, mm. it, you, you sort of set yourself up mentally to go, oh, it's going to be easy. I didn't have to do my homework. And then you get later on you and you're at a disadvantage because you yeah. haven't actually had to try. And I think that's one of the issues. But m more on what we are just saying, the million dollar question I think is, it's how can people here in the Western world on a realistic basis, get that sort of back into their lives. Like that is the big question really, isn't it? How, yeah. What's a realistic way that the average Joe, me and you can sort of get that back? I think that's a big us. part of your mission, isn't it? To show people. Yeah. I think, I think getting out, I think setting goals, I think training, I think exercise is something loads of people have lost in the West. I think out there in the nomadic land, you're naturally moving all the time. There's movement in everything that they do. And I think with movement, it's the endorphins, right? Like you look at, again, Tyson Fury, who was wanting to end his life because he had no goal. He had achieved the the um, the heavyweight world yeah. championship. He was now not training because training for what? And then he got back into the physical training again. And it was like this endorphin. And so he knew that he needed fitness, training and goals and I say that, I always say it's about minimizing time on the phone because the phone brings a lot of comparisons, right? And you yeah. see a lot of people. Oh, correct, like, yeah. I don't have that. I don't have this. Forget that. Do what you can do now. It's breaking down the goals. It's exercising, like training, whatever that might be. It doesn't need to go to the gym. It could be dancing. It could be breakdown. It could be whatever. And getting out there, connect with nature, escape in the city. You don't have to walk the Yangtze River for 352 no. days. You know what I mean? You could just go to the countryside, go for a walk in the woods, just escape the noise, the madness. And yeah. I think people, you could do that one Saturday afternoon, once a week, once every other week. And I think that does really help. It helps you reflect, it helps you connect, reground, you know, and also strategize. So, you know, when you go for a run, like in the morning, afternoon, if you go for a run, 
how listening to music or not listening to music, you're always thinking, like when you're in the shower, some of the greatest ideas come to yeah. mind when you like just because there's that natural movement. It's that routine of I habit. I get all you, my ideas when I'm running. All of them. Yeah, right? Mm. It, you're out there and you're just like fucking thriving because the movement and I think I think that's the first problem to helping mental health is some form of movement in the form of connecting with nature or exercising, but just having those set goals and everything else will, I feel, come after that. Well, I, I completely agree. Because mm. like I was saying earlier, I, I've been injured for the past five weeks. I've not been able to train whatsoever. And mentally, it, it just does you in. You notice it so much. You don't yeah. you start to not feel yourself. If you miss a day at the gym or you miss your yeah. run, you know, you feel a type of way, don't you, about yeah. it? You feel less energized throughout the yeah, day. Yeah, for sure. 100%. And that happens to me as well. I'll wake up and I'll find myself, I'll go to the phone, you know, I'll check the emails and I'm still in bed. And then I'll flip over to check notifications on each of the social media platforms. Mm. And I'm like, fuck, why does am I doing this? Does day right, does it? Does not. No, it does not. And I end up catching myself, you know, Shouting at myself internally, you mm. know, what are you doing? Get yeah, up, sure. get out there, run, put that phone away. Um, and it does, you know, the next morning when I don't do that and I'm out running and I have my usual routine, I find that the whole day ahead of me goes completely differently, mm. you know? So how do you set your day up then as, as far as exercise is concerned? I'll wake up relatively 7, 7.30. I will have a spirulina shake. Right. So a bit of coconut, bit of orange juice, spirulina, um, uh, grass powder, barley grass powder, give it a mix, take that as a shot. First thing to hit my stomach, I'll go out for a run. Worst case, it will just be a walk just to escape. Go for a run, let's say around Battersea Park, come back, push-ups in the room, jump in the shower, or shave and shower. Um, and then I'll have my breakfast, cereal, and then that's when I'll either go out to check my emails or stay in. Because then that takes me to about 8.30, 9 o'clock. I've done my exercise, not for the day, but my first session. And you feel good from that? Then I feel good, you know, yeah. And then uh, that's it then. Then I'm on the phone. And then regardless of if there's some disappointing emails of rejection or really exciting emails, I think I'm way more prepared to read what those emails or notifications may be now that I've exercised. You're not going to think, oh, I'll... I'll that could be negative, so I'll leave it till tomorrow. Yeah. You're just going to open it up because yeah. you're driven and ready yeah. to go. And that happens. You know, sometimes I'll wake up because I'm on juggling three different time zones right now. I'm on the UK, South America, mm. but also China. And so I, there's always going to be something from, from one of these regions, different time zones, you know, even if the UK aren't in work till nine, could wake up and it could be something from the Chinese, Chinese team. Could be good, it could be bad. Let's say a, a, a very well-paid talk that was scheduled has now been cancelled and I see that I'm now overthinking I'm like fuck that's the first thing that I've seen I'm like that's so shit I had that planned who else did I turn down on that day that I've now got to chase and be like I'm now available that day how much is that going to set me back and then that, that's it and so and then I'll find myself being in bed strategizing which is the worst whereas if I read mm. that same email or notification after running have my spirulina shake having a shower then I read it no big deal yeah no worries let's get it booked in for maybe next month or let me know when they want to reschedule and it's wholly, totally different totally mm. different sort of mindset it. that I'm in ready to read and digest the disappointing news or the rejection or whatever it and might conquer be. it either way whether it's good or bad yeah, sort of thing yeah so you are you're quite big in China you broke into like the Chinese sort of market didn't you yeah um I, I find China so interesting and it's even more interesting because of in the West, what sort of stuff we get fed. And mm. obviously you have to take it with a pinch of salt because obviously I imagine they'll, they might say the same as us. You can't really buy into all this that you see online. I no. imagine you've got a bit more of a based opinion on it as a country. Yeah. So what is China like and what are the people like and what are your experiences of it? Mm, yeah, there's a massive because of the, the news, because of the media, there's a massive misconception of yeah. China here in the West for sure. Um, I think some degree is fair, but that comes down to always the government and the politics. My experience there with the people, I just, I remember my friend joined me on Mission Yangtze from Wales and he said to me before he came to China, he had this feeling that it would have been this really suppressed um, country with people sort of down and out doing their own thing. And then he came and he saw people that, that, strong sense of community on the riverbank old ladies doing tai chi or old men 
dance clubs, you know, where people would bring their speakers and set up in the square and there would be like 50 people just getting involved dancing or doing sword tai chi. Or and it was like, they just seemed really happy. He was like, the old people back at home, they stay in their houses, they watch TV, they don't mix and mingle. It's very lonely, isn't it, being an old person in the UK from what the news is saying. Yeah. Whereas out there, they just seem weirdly a little bit more free, a little bit more connected. There's that togetherness. There's that strong sense of community, not just the older generation, but the younger generation. There's no, you know, I'm sure there's bullying, but you won't go out and you won't see gangs. There, There's never, I don't think I've ever seen a group of six lads together hanging causing violence yeah 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 it's, it's not, not a thing yeah, yeah. Well, when I think of China yeah. I think of the think of all the surveillance that everybody's under yeah. straight away that's what my mind goes to but that's because I'm a tech guy so I think that's mental but you bit. are right There's there is that side too mm. there is that side too um, and I saw a very different side to China when I was filming the Great War show in yeah. COVID you know there were more lockdown deaths than there were COVID deaths but people were still locked up being told that they had to mm. stay inside and that's when I did see a lot of the de depress uh, depression from the locals. That's when you could see the suppression. But we also had that here. Yeah, right? we, we yeah, also had people silly. and places like Dubai, who everyone sort of flocks to. They had a really nasty lockdown too. Mm. It, so it is, it, when it's extreme, it is extreme. There's no, there's no hiding that. And I'm not going sit, to sit here and be like, oh, no, it's a wonderful place. No, like, yes, there's that side for sure. Um, um, but we know that side, yeah. you know, we do know mm. that side, but the other side, people don't know when people think of China, they think of Beijing, Shanghai, Chongqing, you yeah, know, these yeah, big cities, course. they don't know that like 80% of the country is just wild. It's vast as well. Deserts that you've not even heard of, like the Taklamakin Desert. You see, I just wouldn't think of that when I think of China, right? it's yeah. interesting, yeah, yeah. Massive desert, of course, the Gobi Desert, which people know, you've got the mountains, it's connected to the Himalayas. Mount Everest, China yeah. effectively claimed that, even great, though people the, think in the pole. The Great Wall, isn't it something like 33,000 miles or something like that? It, it all joined up. It's 21,000 kilometers, 13,000 <laughs> 13, miles. And that is that is some distance. Like yeah. When you stretch it out, it goes like, it's unbelievable. And yeah. what, what is it that you did on the, did you, how far did you? 21,000 kilometers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But so, not walking. Yeah. <laughs> not walking. This was land, air and sea because I've effectively acquired land, air and sea based skills and activities. Uh, and so I can do like the scuba diving. I've got my powerboat license. I've got the fighting martial arts. I can survive in the desert, the jungle, the mountains. James I've, Bond. I've, well, and, and I got, yeah, and I got, you know, my skydiving license, paramotoring, paragliding. And so, but doing these expeditions with it being hiking, I've slotted into a hiking category, which I hate. I don't yeah. like. I don't even like walking as crazy as that <laughs> sounds. It's the survival that I love. It's like mm. going to places that you can't go by if you're on a tarmac road. You can't go by if you're on a bicycle, you know? And where there's a bicycle or a tarmac road, there's people, there's water, there's food, there's Community. safety. Yeah, so I find that walking can take, can take you places where like you can't go by Have any other means. Fearless and far. The guy on um, Instagram, he's a, he's an American and he spends yes. a lot of his time in Africa. Yeah. And I think he got taken on the back of a, uh, like a motorbike into the Congolese jungle. Yeah. And he, he just was there for weeks and everyone was commenting on his post like, where are you? What's happening? Yeah, and he just that's come, right. just comes back. That, and that's amazing. I think that's so interesting. That's so cool, isn't it? he gets stuck into just all their, all their tribes. Yeah. And it's, and you obviously, people, like, I, when I went to Thailand for a month, my yeah. mum goes, be so safe, be so safe. I've never felt so safe in my life. Yeah. Everyone there is so accommodated. The land of smiles, yeah. they call yeah, it, right? that's it. But obviously yeah. he's there in Congo with these tribes. Yeah. And you think, oh, he's in such danger. And they just take him in as if he's meant to be there. He's shining a different light, right? Yeah. A light that people don't know or don't discuss. Yeah. So it's, uh, yeah, it's cool. Yeah. That's yeah. what we need to do. Yeah. Like, that's what you're doing. Yeah. 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 Just show a different side to the people, isn't it? Yeah. Like many times in China, like I did come across people uh, who who were scared and I remember seeing a couple of old ladies local ladies who it may have been their first time seeing a white person before yeah. in the far west of China that they tried running from me but I didn't know that so I started to walk faster chase them chase. <laughs> just to ask them for directions you know and the next minute they climbed an embankment picked up two ro rocks and held them and was shouting in a language that you know it was a certain dialect and I, I filmed that 
And then after that, I sent to as many Chinese people as I possibly knew and no one knew a word what they were saying. How did That's that make you feel when they were throwing, about to throw at you? I realised that at that point they were scared. They were only old ladies. And at that point, you know, I <laughs> had this big beard now growing, red eyes, oh, probably God. sunburnt. You know, big black rucksack. I was all mm. uh, sorry, blue rucksack. I was dressed in blue completely, and so the fact that I only clicked, oh, they were running from me. Oh, I'm <laughs> scary. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, well, that, that's it's a surreal. It's that's like a surreal thought, isn't it? Like, Very. not many people will ever experience what they experience. Yeah. I've been so detached from all different aspects of life, where yeah. you see someone almost completely different to you, like almost yeah. maybe not even human. And then they're getting chased by them, like inadvertently. And you're going, help, please. Yeah. But it, it, they're it probably didn't... still talking about it to this day. Yeah. This random white man that rocked up and chased yeah. us. And that's probably their story. We had to fight for our lives. We held the rock. You know, it's become mm. a thing. Yeah. But, uh, you know, who knows? The Yeti. Yeah. <laughs> who knows what they've now the turned that Yeti. story into? I don't know if they yeah. dreamt it or not. <laughs> yeah, it's mental. Like that stuff happened a lot in Madagascar, a lot. But um, but in China, so there was that side, but the majority of the time, you've got locals really wanting to help. I remember I rocked up in a small community and it was Chinese New Year and they, they knocked on my door because they allowed me to stay there. They knocked on my door and they said, spend Chinese New Year with us. And I was like, no, no, it's fine. You know, I'll just sleep here. I'll rest. So I'm pissed as my toenails have fallen off. I'll leave first thing in the morning. And the lady just kept demanding and demanding. I think five times went... And she was like, it was all in broken English. It was actually her daughter, who was about nine, ten, who spoke English, said that my mum said no one should spend New Year alone. She demands that you spend New Year with us, otherwise she'll be offended. So it's very community driven. Very community. And I was around this table eating Chinese food. And I was like, they just were not allowing me to enter the New Year alone. Chinese food is not like our Chinese and I'm like, food, That's either, is it? No, it's not. And Chinese Full food soul. is so different throughout China. So someone who goes to Beijing and has Chinese food and comes back and says, oh, I don't like Chinese food. That's like saying, that's like going to Italy, having Italian food and saying you don't like European food. It's yeah. like, well, what about yeah. Spanish food, German food, Turkish food, Greek, you know, it's like... It's so what? vast. China it's so is vast. ginormous. Yeah, yeah it's mm. absolutely ginormous. Yeah. Um, so when I think of Madagascar, I think of Melman. And and uh, yeah, the, the the little the little one. What's his name? King Julian. King Julian. <laughs> it's not, it's Julian. not Catalima. Is is it anything like the films it's, at all? Uh, no, no, no. It's not. <laughs> no. It Although a, there were lots of King Julians everywhere. Julian was it? Julius. King Julian. King Julian. It was King, King yeah, Julian. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Catalimas everywhere, and and the Catalimas they actively are sun worshippers, and so in the morning the sun would rise and you would literally have the Catalimas looking facing at the sun and they'd put their arms up like that and they'd just be like oh my god because of the warmth of the sun it's, the not... cute, it's actually the cutest mm, thing you look at over yeah, we need like... to do that more as people we can't really do it here that much can you <laughs> look a little bit weird wouldn't you yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there'd be a drive by or something it's not raining as well halfway through that's yeah. the main issue yeah. um, so that one what that was how long was that one 1600 five months yes yeah, 155 days. And it was only 100 miles more than Mongolia. That was longer than Mongolia? Yeah, that was oh, a bigger one, oh, bigger really? trip. But oh. I think a lot of people perceive the Mongolia one as the bigger one. Well, I think when you look at the maps, obviously when you look at a flat map, it, it distorts the centre because obviously like Congo is ginormous. But because when you obviously sh- shrink a sphere yeah. down, the centres sh- are a lot smaller. That's it, yeah. yeah. Like Mongolia is the bigger country. Yeah. But because the route that I was taking through Madagascar, the mileage was higher than Mongolia. Um, but no, Madagascar is, yeah, it's big. It's, I believe, landmass, 2.5 times the size of the UK. And it's the fourth largest island in the world. But you're right, it's just sandwiched yeah. right down there, just off the, the coast of Africa, right down south as well, so it looks smaller. Yeah. But it's a, uh, it's a big island. Hundred, so it's only one hundred miles longer than Mongolia in terms of the um, the mileage that I did, but almost took me double the duration to complete. Is that because to... of the jungles and things like that? Oh, I want to talk about everything. animals. Yeah. What what yeah. what have you experienced as far as like something maybe coming to kill you or in terms uh, are we on Madagascar or, like, or I in couldn't, general? I couldn't go near. No, any, yeah, any. Ma- any, any, okay, any, yeah, yeah. I thought it would be quite dear in Madagascar though. Obviously, being with it. Being so jungle like, I'm 
Maybe yeah. Wrong. No, you're right. Yeah, there was a lot. I think definitely the scariest was West China, the Yangtze right. River. You're not doing anything to a bear. No. Know? And you've got, and sort of when I, so when I went out to China, I went with, I call it the healthy Western mentality of, oh, you leave the bear alone and the bear will leave you alone because that's what people say. And then the locals were telling me otherwise. And I believed I should trust the locals who live with the bears more than the Westerners. You don't think they were trying to put UK. you off? No, I, they started to back up photos and videos saying this is why you should not be here during the Grizzly. hunting season, Tibetan brown bear. Oh. Um, so not as big as grizzly, but... Is that like what? Bear. Is that what you use yeah. Tibet, the Tibetan mastiffs are for? They tried to use the Tibetan mastiffs to ward off snow leopards, wolves and bears. And the Tibetan mastiffs are massive. And they're normally staked in the ground. Didn't you get chased by one? I was attacked by two, yeah. Attacked by two, went on for about two minutes. Had to throw rocks and then I ran out of rocks and then they were really close to me. So close I couldn't even bend down to kick, to pick up rocks. So I had What to do you do them. then? Do you have to like just pretend you're the bigger yeah. thing? <laughs> You've got to almost make them flinch as well. So I remember many a times just trying. Yeah, that's mental. Try, have you got the image up there? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It looks like a bear, right? Yeah, they're it mental. Looks... I bet they've got to be what? 50, 60 kilograms? They'd probably say more. A yeah. Yeah. A yeah, re oh, mental. yeah, I reckon. About yeah. that. So and so they were they were terrifying. So they usually try to keep away the bears, but it depends on the hunger of the bears. Right. This local that we came across, he was just in this concrete hut, deep in sort of the forest and the mountains, bordering Tibet. And then we rocked up. He allowed us to stay with him. And he starts showing us photos and videos, and they were horrific of men like mauled to death by bears of CCTV, the news channel out there showing a bear walking into a community, into a hut and killing a family, like looking out of the window with like blood and an arm in its mouth. And oh I'm my just God. Like, and he's trying to send me these. And a lot of these I deleted from my phone because I just didn't like that energy. Yeah. You know, being on my phone. Mm. And he, I said, do you have, it was translated through a guy oh. who I had with me. Um, I asked if he had any experience and he says this, uh, only two weeks ago, this bear walked uh, down from the mountains because it was so you've got the you've got torpor season so the bears effectively they come off the mountains when it gets too cold they actively look for food for calories before they go into torpor which is their version of hibernation and so that's the wrong month to be there but because the expedition was delayed by two and a half months it put me in bear hunting season effectively and so he said that there was a bear that came off the mountains who could smell something in the hut probably the guy, tried to, it, so it walked into the courtyard, passed his Tibetan Mastiff, did not give a fuck, walked straight past the Mastiff, Mastiff didn't do shit, and started scratching at his steel door for 15 to 20 minutes. And I was like, I was like, what did you do? He said, I hid in my kitchen cupboard. Like the whole time I was like, yeah, it was so big, I expected it to get through. If I was get, a bear, that's the first place I'd look for food. Yeah, so, right. The kitchen cupboard. Well, the kitchen cupboard. <laughs> kitchen cupboard. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Not and the best then, hiding spot. <laughs> yeah. And then I'm there in a tent and he, it, the bear's trying to break through a steel door with a Tibetan Mastiff. I don't have no steel door. No. I don't have no Tibetan Mastiff. And he presented me, I remember he presented me with this knife. <laughs> this isn't going to do shit to a bear. And he's you need like, a fish. And he's like, no, it's not. But there you go. And so we, we had that a lot. And that, as far as animals go, I wasn't scared whatsoever before I went to the Yangtze about bears. But when I was there, I was shit scared. Almost every day for the first two and a half, three months. Because I knew that they were there and I would have to make noises. And I took a, a whistle and an air horn. And the locals were laughing, saying that's not... And they would share their stories of why that won't help. Um... One guy pulled me out and he said, see that hut there? And there's a hut on the other side of the river. He was like, that used to be our neighbor, lived beside us for five years. He came back one day and three bears were in his hut. He came back on his motorbike. He started beeping the motorbike horn, thinking it would scare the bears. The bears came out and went to attack him and he just drove off. He said, we, we didn't see him again. Like he didn't die, but he never came back to that bear infested hut. Jesus like, Christ. 
That is mental. That mental. Is. So you hear these stories and you can't help but allow that to get to your psyche. It's one thing though hearing them and then and then the next thing actually trying to put into context that that actually happened to somebody. Do you know I what know. I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. And you can see the hut there. It's chained up now as well. Oh my goodness. You know, and you're just like, oh God, that's scary. And you know that you've got to wake up. Uh, I think that next day I had to smash out a 55, 60 kilometer day and my guide was injured. So he was going by motorbike to a nearby town evacuation. And then I had to walk through those woods. And I remember the whistle in my mouth, walking high adrenaline, as you can imagine, as fast as I could, blowing the whistle because it was still dark. I didn't want to approach a bear on accident because normally if the bear sees a human and it's too close, out of fear, out of defense, it will, it will attack because you've mm. just scared it. So I was trying to blow the whistle so that it would hear me and maybe scurry off the path. Um, well, you're not scared that it would it would bring its attention to you? Because blowing a whistle is obviously an attention-drawing thing. Yeah, I, there is that side, but the locals were saying it's better to blow the whistle and hope that they hear something that they're not familiar with. Than shock one. And it'll scurry rather than shock one. Yeah, okay, understand. Yeah, and so there was that. There were also the, the wolves. Um, the wolves I weren't as scared of in China as I was in Mongolia. In Mongolia, they're grey wolves. They're the big wolves. Right, know? yeah, yeah. In, Mon in China, they are smaller, but there was something that happened in China that could have turned out to be nasty. And I was with Kyle from Texas. He was videographer for a few days there. And we came across this Tibet, uh, these four or five Tibetan, it was in the National Geographic documentary, actually. So I'm so glad he caught it. But there were like four guys, Tibetan, speaking Tibetan, trying to warn us of something we didn't fully understand. So we were kind of, oh, shishi ni, you know, thank you, bye bye. And yeah, we yeah. carried on walking. For the next two days, we were followed by a pack of wolves. And we remember them being in close proximity to us for two whole days. First, it was like the hour. We were like all inspired. This is crazy. We gathered maybe there was about five or six wolves. And then the hours went by and we were like, they're still like, they normally cover big distance, you know, bigger than humans yeah, cover, yeah, but yeah. they were still in close proximity, almost the other side of the hill. Then the next morning, we could still hear them. Later on that day, they, we, and we realized, okay, they can see us. We can't see them, but I think they're, now following and looking for any signs of weakness. But at that point, again, I still wasn't worried because I thought human, the wolves don't really attack humans. No. Maybe the bigger wolves, you hear a lot of stories in Canada and Alaska, but not really in the west of China, I wasn't that scared. Anyway, after two days, they disappeared. We carried on. Six months later, the production team in Beijing who were putting together the Nat Geo show contacted me and said you had no idea what this guy was saying, but he was warning you not to go down that valley because only yesterday a local was killed by a pack of wolves. Oh my God. And it was all captured on camera. Kyle wasn't going to, like not the killing of the, but <laughs> them warning us, us oblivious. Yeah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And we're like, whether it was the same pack or not, we don't know. But the, the fact, fact they're that following you. Like... The fact they're following, the fact that we thought they're not going to risk attacking a human, then we realised, oh, they did. And they mm. were successful. Like, oh, they were probably God. scoping you out. Yeah, Maybe the I fact reckon. there was two of you, they yeah. probably deterred them a little bit. 100%. And we had rucksacks as well, makes us look mm, bigger. Yeah, for sure. And we weren't limping because we were fresh on the expedition. We were only about a month in, you know? So, um, yeah. But then Madagascar had different kind of wildlife. That's I was going to say, you get them the smaller animals like snakes and crocodiles, yes. which are just as dangerous, but obviously smaller than bears. Yeah. 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 Um, the crocs, we had a lot of r sort of crocodile infested rivers that we would have to cross. And that was my biggest sort of fear. That is scary because you can't see them, right? You can't see them. Yeah. And if there's no locals to give you advice or guidance on where to cross, it meant that we would have to detour and search for white water or rapids because crocs don't have their territory there. Right. And if we couldn't see any signs of white water or rapids, we'd then have to build a raft using bamboo, bamboo leaves to strap it together. And each time this would take like four hours. The hippos there? No. No. That's, that's no. the only lucky part that you, yeah. Y you know what? Madagascar doesn't have very venomous uh, insects uh, or dangerous wildlife at all, really. You've got the boa constrictor. You ha have got certain snake, uh, certain spiders. But you've got, other than the crocs, you haven't got your lions, your leopards, uh, your hippos, which is strange because it, so... 
90 percent or it was 80 or 90 percent of all plant life and wildlife found in madagascar is found nowhere else in the world which means it's the number one most unique country on the planet and so what you come across in madagascar is stuff similar to india and africa because over 65 million years ago they used to be connected and they split and apparently the everything moved apart from madagascar so it must be like really deep rooted Mm. And so you've got things that you see that's very similar to that that you see in India, like thousands of miles away, and then things that are similar to to Africa, but things like lions, uh, leopards, you know, the, the hippos, the certain things that you would find in Africa, all of the venomous snakes and spiders aren't in Madagascar. So it's weird how that happened, yet there are Nile crocodiles in Madagascar from the Nile River that runs through mm-hmm. Africa. So it's this crazy sort of fauna and flora, biodiverse mix of multiple countries. When you when you deep it, it's insane how safe of an island we are. Like unnaturally oh, yeah. safe. Yeah. Like there's what could kill us here? You could get run over by a herd of cows. Yeah. And that's about that's it. the biggest danger in terms of wildlife here, right? Is, yeah. Is the cows <laughs> wildlife? Yeah. Mm. Which is, yeah. And that's just an insane thought, isn't it? When yeah. these people are having to navigate their country and avoid. X, Y, and Z. Yeah. Whereas we... Literally the difference between life and death, isn't it? Yeah. And I mean, if you look at sort of natural disasters as well, we're not in a hazardous area where it comes to Mm. tectonic plates shifting. Tsunamis. It's like... We're far too soft here, aren't we? We need at least something. (laughs) At least something. Yeah, someone needs to come and shake us up a bit, doesn't it? I think the cows are trying to do that, aren't they? Yeah. You dare cross my field. (laughs) So with what coming up, you've got the Amazon. Yes. What, so what are going to be your biggest hazards on this expedition? And what and give us a bit of an idea on times, frames. What you said you're going to start in Suriname, Suriname. Suriname, yeah. yeah. So this one is this is the fourth world first record. There will be three records from this one mission and the duration is looking to take from about 40 to 50 days. So not a massively long one like the Yangtze, but the intensity is ramped right up. So for example, Suriname is probably one of the most uncharted, unexplored countries left in the in the world. It's the greenest country on the planet, and ninety four percent of the country is just pure jungle coverage. Yeah, I think I heard you say on on something online that there's nowhere to land anywhere. Yeah, so you have to get a heli in. Yes, and there's there's animals that people haven't even discovered yet. Yeah, there will be. Yeah, whether we see them or not, we don't know. But absolutely, there's animals in there. That is mental. Yeah, mental. Yeah. Yeah. And so this is going to be a mission where the intensity is so high, where's one wrong footing, you could pay the ultimate price. Not that anything's necessarily out to get you. It's just that the Amazon is just this one big sort of defensive ecosystem where everything is there to uh, to defend itself. Like even the branches and the leaves, you rub one side and it's completely fine. You rub the other and it's pulled your skin off. Mm. You know, you stand on the back end of a snake because it's all camouflage you're done for. What you does, go in the river and there's a stingray or piranha or electric eel, you're done for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what does what does preparation for this at home look like then? Preparation. Other is, than Google Maps. Yeah, th- there's not a lot that we can do. So what started mm. as, a, as a really cool adventure and potential world first has turned into a mission and a three-time world record of something that isn't just an adventure now, but it's almost like old-school exploration of the yeah. 1800s. There's no evidence that the source has been mapped. And we've contacted mapping associations in Suriname, in the Netherlands, because it used to be Dutch occupied, uh, and the Royal Geographic Society here in the UK. And it's all skewered. There, There's evidence to show that there have been expeditions in the 1800s where people, I think his name was something Kirk, tried to venture as far west as possible. But due to disease, wildlife, they only mapped a certain part of the interior and then and then bailed. Since then, yes, people have been on the Copenham River and uh, near the source, but no one's really mapped the true coordinates of the source of the river, the which Copenham River. Fort. Which pff, Which is crazy. Will this go on National Ge- Geographic or anything like that? As of about a week or two ago, we've now teamed up with a production company called One Tribe TV. So whilst I want this heavily to be pushed on social media, we're also looking to film for a TV show as well. Where that will sell, we don't know. I've had a lot of luck everywhere except the UK. All of my shows air internationally. 
but there's never been any support from the British TV. Surely David Attenborough would love to get his just just in the intermission spots talking <laughs> over it. Wouldn't that be the ultimate? Like yeah, that's that the that's insane. the pinnacle. Yeah, it is literally. Yeah, it is. And he, I'm sure if it, if he ended up hearing about it, he'd be all over it. Yeah, literally, John Montoya. Well, would be I all think on this it. is because it's an expedition. He doesn't really do expeditions, does he? Oh yeah. So I think that his is more planet Earth. You know, these yeah. crazy sort of stories on wildlife and Earth itself, but um. But because this is more of a grueling sort of hands-on expedition, um, I see it being more maybe maybe National Geographic or Discovery or Netflix. Yeah, because yeah, a proper docu type thing. Yeah, yeah, proper. I would like it to be a feature film, sixty to ninety mm. minutes. Amazon Prime have got a big budget. Amazon Prime as well. Yeah, I think they'd be a good good uh, thing for it. So it really comes down to me and me and Jacob and what we're able to film out there. Um, yeah. And if we're able to film some epic stuff, it's always weird because you go out with some expectation of the adventure. Like for Madagascar, people would say, oh, we would like to turn it into a TV show, but what will happen? And you can say you're going to walk south to east, uh, south to north. You're going to summit the eight highest mountains. It's going to be a world record and just sort of different terrains that you're going to go through. But there's no way I would have known I would have had to carry a chicken called Gertrude. I would have caught the deadly strain of malaria. I would have been held up at gunpoint by the military. I would have avoided the bandits. I would have been bitten by spiders and leeches. I would have had to hunt and and gather in the jungles up north, crossing crocodile infested rivers, you know, build rafts, shelter and all mm. of this madness. I never knew this would happen. And so I talk about Suriname now and it just seems like a, a blank canvas. I know that there's going to be potentially no place to land in which we'll have to hover the helicopter solo and, and physically jump into the river covered in piranha. And hope that you don't in. hit rocks underneath. Rocks as well, yeah. yeah. And then from there, we then need to navigate to find the source, true exploration. And if we're successful, we need to map it. We then need to summit the highest peak where there's, there's been more people in space than on the summit of this highest mountain. You see you don't know how long it's going to take either to get to the summit. We, and we don't know. Anywhere from, which is crazy, anywhere from four days to 14 days. Jesus. Yeah. So it's like the story's going to write itself, isn't it, really? It, along the way, yeah. you're exactly correct. Yeah, it's. I think it's just going to happen and we're going to be like, we never knew it'd be. I think we'll get to day five and we'll be like, there is no way I could yeah. have anticipated it'd be such a crazy adventure and we've not even really started. Are you recording a lot of the build up to it? Yeah, like, we're trying to. Yeah, I think that's a good thing for it. Yeah. The start of it's sort of like the building up to it. Yeah. And then yeah. sort of like the, oh my God, we had no idea. Exactly. That's a good part of it. Yeah, build it. I'm yeah. trying to share a clip on social media a day as well. Yeah. You know, a video of a, a day behind the scenes, you know, the training, the preparation, the map work, the route, what it entails. Um, I'd like to do a podcast with my girlfriend as well, get her take on it, what's her thoughts um, and view. You know, I think that yeah, would all be, and, and we build it up. And then at two weeks today, I fly. So, so, that's so good. what's your girlfriend's thoughts now? She is, she shitted herself. She's excited for me. Yeah. Cause she is like, this is you, this is what you do. And Biggest just fan. go yeah, out this there is it. Yeah, yeah. And, and get it done, but come back home safely you know promise me you'll come back home safely and won't do anything silly no sh no stupid risks but there's there's times where especially at night time where she is anxious where she she sees all the preparation that i do and that gives her great confidence because she sees i'm studying and learning everything that can go wrong and i'm studying how i can overcome each thing but she just thinks with this it feels different because you can prepare for all of it, but if you stand on a stingray and it's Bob goes right through your calf and now you're relying on being evacuated and the helicopter can't get to you because there's a storm. It just takes one mistake, doesn't it? It takes one mistake. If you step in the wrong place or if you step on a bushmaster and it bites you, you know, just enjoy the sunset because you're done for. How long have you been with her then? Uh, almost four years. So she, she, you got together... And she knew what she was signing up for then. Yeah. So yeah. So that's yeah. so she that's a bit different then. It yeah. is. She, she, knew, knew, she about, knew what was yeah. she knew about Mongolia, Madagascar, and the Yangtze. I'd done them whilst I wasn't in a relationship with her. Um she kind of thought because I kind of hoped that I would be able to stop risking my life as much and go into more TV shows. And where there's TV, there's safety numbers. If there's a production crew, you're set. You know, if there's any any sort of team members with with um, cameras 
you know that there's a team. And... That's why it's probably hard for you to get these camera guys to come and follow you because yeah. where you are is just not it for is. them, is it? Yeah, like with the Yangtze, of the 16 different people that tried to join me, join different sections, 10 were evacuated, all gone. Altitude sickness, vulnerability, fear of wildlife, injury, all gone, which took up all the budget of these. Oh, yeah, for you. yeah, we did, go. Did a, vlog, did a vlog every day for a year. He's the man with the camera. Yeah, yeah. I, did, yeah I, grew, I grew to popularity through daily vlogging. It's every yeah, really? day for like a couple of years. So what were you, what were you documenting? It was just daily life. I was, I've always been motivated for work. So yeah. I do like motivational speeches on yeah. a lot of what we've talked about today on the fitness side of things yeah. and the mental side Mindset, of things. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's how I came to the consistency. Oh, nice. Like you were saying, the daily posts. It's they're, hard. They're, 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 it's hard, but that's what does it. But in the like, days I like thought I wasn't going to do it, but I pushed through. Those are the days that made the difference. Yeah, do you know 100%, what I mean. Yeah, it's very and same. It takes to your a story. lot as well, doesn't it? Because you know, even me around here, I find myself slacking a lot because I'm like, oh yeah, I'll be able to film loads in the jungle because I'll be out there and there'll be no one there. Whereas here, it's almost more sort of um, intense with the different people that are around. If you're at a train station. And I pull out my camera and start filming. I'm almost too paranoid. People yeah. watching. Whereas you've got to give, I'm completely give, over that, you see. give less of a fuck, haven't you? Yeah. yeah and I respect hard. people like that who can do that. I'm like, I need more of that. I need to just. I was trying to make cares? people laugh in the lift earlier and you were getting well anxious. Well, <laughs> normally, I'm, normally I'm really fine with it. Normally I, I could go up to anyone saying a thing and then we were just sat yeah. in such a con tight, tight quiet, elevator and, quiet. You, and you just. And it's so unlike you it's as well. made a stupid noise. He just went, eh. <laughs> and I just turned around and went, what on earth are you doing, mate? And I just got me out of this elevator. I've got no, I'm, I'm not bothered. The you know, I'm not, okay. no, nothing. No they all like headphones anything. on Did anyway. they laugh though? Yeah. Well, Funny. no, they no. didn't. <laughs> That's what made it even worse. But like we were saying, with, with your partner, it, it makes the stakes yeah. even higher. But I don't know if you've ever seen, have you ever seen mm. The Alpinist? I haven't. It's an, I think you would love it. It's mm. so so do you know who Alex Honnold is? Does yes. free solo. Yeah. So at the start of the Alpinist, he's talking about this guy called Marc Andre Leclerc, who was living in Canada, mm -hmm. way out the way. And he was just doing these climbs that were completely unheard of. Wow. Like no one, no one would there was people that had been in the climbing scene for years and they were just seeing him doing them. And everyone was going, What the hell? Like mm. free free soloing up ice. Jesus. But he wasn't doing it for anything other nope. than for himself. And he wasn't telling anyone he was doing it. Yeah. So these people were coming out to follow him and film him. And um, he went down to Patagonia where you've got, it's called, it's it's like, it looks like a knives, knives pick, like go straight okay. up like this. I, I can't remember what it's called. But he said that he was going to climb that. And then he went MIA off this, this uh, camera team who were filming him. Yeah. He went completely MIA off grid. And uh, he climbed it free solo without anyone knowing and come back down he said right okay now you can come film me and it's he says because that they were there it wasn't the same actual experience yes he needed to be on his own to get the actual free yeah. solo and then he took them back up but um the, when he went back up I, it was meant i think he was going to summit in two days on his own a, a film himself with a gopro yeah. and when he got up camped on this cliff edge and um, a storm hit, like a horrific Shit. storm. And he's filming himself, black skies. He's descended through the storm in like almost pitch black, got down, and then they're all like, oh, it's, it's off, it's off. Does it again in about 10 days when the weather clears up. But I think it's the being on your own and experience it is completely different to say yeah. like with your TV people. Yeah. You don't get the... The adrenaline, the the fear no. of it almost takes that fun cool. out of it for you, doesn't yeah. it? That it adrenaline does. fun. Yeah, and I experienced that on the Great War when I filmed that Great War show. That was like a big multi million dollar show, international six time one hour TV show that was on airlines as well, hope, hoping to get it in the UK. And that just, it wasn't an adventure. It was work. It Nullified. was it was a TV show. Yeah, there were members who wanted certain things, and it took the the exciting element out of it. It was great for me because I was like hosting and presenting my very first, although I did host and present the Yangtze, this was just a lot different because that was on an actual world first, whereas this was now hosting and presenting a TV. Everything was safe. Everything was fine. There was still different activities, but with a team comes the health and safety, which my girlfriend loves. But with me, it's a case of, like I, I wasn't even allowed to drive the buggy. He was the police officer. I had to wear my red jacket. We had to pretend I was driving the buggy. We're in the middle of a desert. What does it matter? We're not on the road. I think that's probably partly because it was in China. 
and then the team and there was bickering and then there was arguments and and it was COVID as mm. well. So often you've got bank because we partnered with the government, they'd be knocking on the door. We need to evacuate the city. And we were like the only one giving heads up. And yeah. That's a privilege, I understand. But we'd evacuate this city and I'd have to read these lines, learn the script, research this person that we're going to meet, know everything about him. Okay, action. You know, and then it's you'd be not, like, not a raw experience. hey, Jamie, so good to meet you. Oh, do that again. And then again and again. And when it comes to you, like, take. Yeah, right, yeah. Jamie, good to, good to meet. And it's like the energy just dropped. Mm. It was totally different, yeah. And I never really talked much about the Great War because it's it it's not there as a natural passion. It's not. Me. It wasn't raw. It wasn't an experience. It was too. Over, it was like overproduced for you in a way. Yeah, and they, it would have been amazing if they let me do what I wanted to do. Like I wanted to jump out of the helicopter and land on the Great War, skydiving wise. This was all part of the plan. I did scuba dive the Great War. I wanted to paramotor over the Rainbow Mountains, and I think doing it this way. Because we did a journey and it was a journey of the Great Wall of China via land, air and sea, talking about the history, meeting the people that call the Great Wall home and like showing off the diversity of China. But in a very fun and adventurous way, trying all sorts of weird foods and, all, you know, a mm. whole mix of everything. That was the idea, but it very much on editing, it turned into a history show. And so yeah. it was sort of less Ash Dykes and more Simon Reeve. You know, which mm. no no offense to him, that's not me. That's not what I do, and I just there was no excitement then to. So part of me is like, oh, it's a shame it didn't get into the UK. But part of me is kind of like, well, no, you're there for the raw adrenaline side of things, aren't you? Yeah, I want it to be fun. Yeah. I want it to target Gen Z as well as the millennials and the older generation. Mm. I want it to be mad. I want people to watch it and think that was insane. Don't want it to be like, oh, so this section of the wall going back 1,500 yeah. years ago, blah, blah, blah. That side is an element and that's interesting. And that has to be done as well. But that just locks in the older generation. And you don't want that to take over. I don't want that to take over. And I felt it was very much 70% of a issue, which is interesting because I've never actually spoke yeah. about the Great Wall mm -hmm. on any podcast. Yeah. Yours is the first that I yeah. like. Because no one really asks about the Great Wall because yeah. no one really, people know about Mongolia, the Madagascar, the Yangtze. The Great War was probably the biggest step of my entire adventure in Korea. Yeah. But it didn't break in the UK and I wasn't allowed to talk about it on social media because TV wanted exclusivity. Of course. And that's why with Suriname, I didn't want any involvement with TV. And I said no to many TV stations and production teams. But this one production team that stepped up, they were like, you have all of the rights. You can do what you want on social media. We, we just want to come and film you. No, we just want all of the rushes afterwards and want to have a chance of creating a, a great TV show and sell it after. And then they can blow mm. it up as well. Look, and yeah, which, it. so the fact that they aren't saying, don't post on socials whatsoever, give us all of the footage and we'll pitch the TV. That's like a no-go. But the fact that they're saying, do what you want, share on social, build the following in case it, the TV doesn't hit. Because I found that with my expeditions, TV have always wanted exclusivity. Therefore, I don't shout an awful lot on social media. Therefore, the, the growth is very slow and steady. Yeah. And then you've got people who will go out, do cool adventure, not share for TV, but share on socials. And it's like, boom, a million plus followers. And you're like, that's the way to do it. Mm. Russ Cook, obviously, it's, a, it's amazing what he yeah, did. And, social and, media, yeah. and, and he has, uh, rightfully so, gotten yeah. what he deserved, the credit for it. Yeah. But uh, if he was just locked into like X, X, Y, and Z and they didn't get it, he probably wouldn't be in the situation he's in now. A hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think he's like the biggest example of that, really. Yeah, he just hit it hard on social media and that's the way. And then I do think that there's definitely room to build demand because what I didn't understand with TV is they want all of the exclusivity and that's great, that's fine. But if there's no demand because no one even knows about the trip, yeah. Like I think definitely now that people are aware of um, Russ Cork doing Africa, even though... The exclusivity isn't there for TV. It's on YouTube because of the demand. TV should well take it. It goes part mm. to that part. Yeah, yeah, it'll go yeah. filters through. Because now it? they're going to get viewership. They're going to have people sign in or like if it's yeah. streaming or watch TV because it's playing because well, they're aware of it. I think what TV don't grasp a lot of them is it's a funnel and you need to funnel things into the TV and they don't. And that's mm -hmm. one of the biggest issues that they have. And that's yeah. why it's dying now because uh -huh. there is no funnel to it. hundred percent. It, it's, it's a funneling system. Yeah. What I was going to say to you is, um, like you were saying, what's on, what with the, um, 
with the uh, Chinese, the wall, yes. Great Wall of China, no one was sort of watching it thinking, oh, what's next? Because it wasn't as raw. Yeah. But I, when you get back, I imagine you'll have this feeling of what's next yeah. and maybe like post-adventure blues. How do you overcome them? Are they overwhelming? Is it hard to get over it? Are you sat there itching for the next thing? Uh, no, I find I did after Mongolia. I was very much like, oh my God, I need to make Madagascar happen soon. And I don't think there was even one year between completing Mongolia and doing Madagascar. It was yeah. back to back mm. almost, you know? Um, whereas with this, there's lots of opportunities now coming more my way because of the previous records and because of announcing this one. And so there's already a couple of projects lined up for TV, but there's also a couple of projects lined up that I just want to pursue directly. So I do know when I come back in mid-October, having touched wood successfully completed Suriname, on the TV news stations, all of this, when they say what next, I want to be able to give an answer. Right now, I don't have a definite answer, but I do know I, I, I will have an answer. Yeah. And I want to, that's the best point in time as well, to shout that there's something next, because I've always missed an opportunity of them saying what's next. and be like, ride the high. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Keep, I'm, and I'm always like, oh, it's top secret now, but I'll be announcing it soon. It's like, no shout about it now because mm. you might not be back on BBC World News again, you know? Yeah, Get yeah, it out yeah. there. And so um, there's a few things happening in China. Um, again, international TV shows that we're working on. Um, there's, yeah, there's a, there's a few things in the, in the world. You, you can't say, you obviously can't say, we're not going to ask you to give us a bit of a glimpse <laughs> into what's coming, yeah. but what to you, and this would, it might be a hard question to ask, yeah. would be your ultimate exploration that might not even be feasible or might you might not ever be able to do for it until some new technology comes out but to you what is the pinnacle of your exploration if you could do it if i could do it um what would it be it was the yangtze yeah it, the yangtze was this whole thing that i think that is the toughest river to plan for logistically yeah not in terms of dangers and threats i think to being given the green light before COVID to get that close to Tibet and stay the course of the entire length of the river, I don't think there can be a second person that does that now after COVID because it's so much more sensitive. I think I got in there at the right time. And I think if someone looks to do that and become second person to do it, it will be years from now. So that was mm. kind of like the whole, you know, if I can do this, China will really have my back because I would have crossed and they really have. So it pulled off. But it was out of the Yangtze River and the Congo River. So I was planning both Congo simultaneously. Looks, looks mm. quite crazy. So I was looking at both. I was planning both. Logistically, the Congo got the green light a year before the Yangtze River, but the Yangtze River was looking more promising with sponsors. And in terms of financial business, it made a lot more sense because there's a lot of money to be had in China, right? Yeah. So I wanted to build my personal brand in that market. So there is something to do that's still there close to my heart when it comes to the Congo River. And I think whoever does that, it will probably go down as, like the Yangtze, one of the greatest expeditions the past decade, I reckon. But it's borderline suicide as well. Yeah. Because there you have got your hippos. You have got undiscovered diseases. You have got all your snakes. And I do think it will be a similar experience to the Serena expedition that I'm about mm. to attempt. It's just this will be a lot shorter. Yeah. The, I think the Congo will take at least a year to do. There is a guy, I don't know if you've seen him, called Dio Runs, and he's running from Cape Town to yeah. London to okay. show off immigration. He had to sort of circumnavigate and take a little flight out of Sudan, I think, because there's a, a war going on. Mm -hmm. and it might be a different country. Yeah. But um, I've always thought, if you look on your map, so you've got like the Bering Strait, haven't you, which goes from the top of Russia over to Canada. Yes. And doesn't that freeze over? Yes. Have you ever even crossed your mind of maybe go from like Scotland all the way down around obviously Russia's hard at the minute over the Bering Strait through America and almost do like a lap from the UK to the east coast of America like that is like the ultimate ring ring isn't it yeah I haven't I haven't only because whenever America or UK's in it I lose that excitement isn't naturally yeah. there because I think English language you know, easy to get by, nothing new. I'll be coming across, you know, Americans. Yeah. Or, or In a sense, it's too comfy for you. You stand there it, like that with your thumb out and then you're done. Yeah. Yeah, but I, I think it would be, yeah, hardcore. I have considered like maybe a North Pole, South Pole mm, trip yeah. would be cool. But at the same time, 
I think because I was looking at Greenland as mm. I was looking at Madagascar. So I've always been looking at two simultaneously. It was the Yangtze, the Congo, and it was Greenland or Madagascar. And for both of the, well, especially with the Madagascar trip, I picked that because in Greenland, whilst it would be a hardcore challenge, which it would physically and mentally, I kind of thought for TV and for people following the journey, they would just have to see my face the whole time, me talking about my emotions. And then other than that, it's all white. Snow, yeah. Whereas Madagascar, you've got the wildlife, you've got the jungle, you've got the deserts down south, you've got the people, you've got people who had never seen a white person before. So it's less about me and my thoughts and feelings and one man and his mission, more about the country, the island, the food, mm. the diversity. And so I think for TV, what would stop me about the North and the South Pole is there wouldn't be much to watch. Yeah, I would still like to do it as a personal challenge, knowing that maybe TV wouldn't take it. Um, because I think social media would still be interested in that stuff, right? A lot of people are interested in physical and mental. What, has anyone crossed Antarctica? Yes. Yeah, oh. I think there's been a good few people. Um, there's got Mike, Mike Horn. He's an absolute badass. He is in his late 50s or 60s. And I believe he completed it already. He was the first to circumnavigate the world via both poles with no motorized vehicle. So that was like crossing all of Antarctica on skis and then sailing, you know, because he couldn't use an engine and then Jeez. sailing. And then I think he, he walked through the North Pole, but in the winter where it's 24 seven pitch black and he had like a polar bear scurrying through his sleigh and it sat on his leg, was crushing his leg and his partner, like his mate next to him was, uh, was just starting to wake up. So he covered his mouth and was like telling him, there's, don't make it, there's a bear sitting on me and it doesn't know we're here. Oh, and that's like, unreal. Oh, real. You know? So he's got some crazy... Yeah, yeah, and he yeah. is like... So what I love about this game is it's not like the UFC or boxing. You've got until you're, you know, uh, mid-30s, unless you're Floyd Mayweather, 40. Yeah. Top of his game, though. Um, mm. But boxing, football players, all of this, you're talking 30s, right, packing, yeah. but... Then you've got in this game, you've got Sir Ranald Fiennes. What's he? Early 80s. I think when he was 77, he did the Marathon de Sables. You've got Mike Horn, who still does backflips off like Land Rover Defenders, who does like circumnavigates the pole, uh, the, the world. You know, more longevity. Still, yeah, there's more longevity if you look after yourself. And I think whilst he doesn't have maybe that physical attributes on his side anymore, he's got the wisdom and experience, mm. right? And so... Um, you can go, but I don't want to necessarily be gone forever doing this kind of stuff. But I'd yeah. love to touch slightly on your yeah. physical health mm. and your training. Has it, if at all, changed from yeah. your training you did for back in 2014 for Mongolia? Yeah. Um, and, and what are you looking like training-wise for the physical side of things? Yeah. Uh, like, how do I feel physically now compared to when I was 24? Yeah, and what you were doing back then differently to now to train? Yeah, it's it's. I would say it's a very similar method mm. to how I'm training now to back then. Right. It's just I've probably managed to shorten down the rest and recovery time. Therefore, the training sessions I'm able to get done quicker now than I was back then. How do you do that? How do you shorten the rest? I think over time and with muscle memory, my endurance has just gotten slightly better that in between sets, I don't need 10 seconds. I need like however long it takes me to get from the pull-up bar to the push-up bench, for example, you know? Right. Seconds. And so I'll be doing this back to back. And I think I've had a lot of people that have joined me for different routines and it, I found out of everything, it's that that gets them. It's that that breaks them down or makes them vomit. I've had a few people almost pass out. Mm. Is is the the no breaks in between, and so the warm up. What I call is, I'll do fifteen pull ups, wide on pull ups, um, fifteen push ups, and then eight or ten uh, ring dips. Right. Yeah. That's one set. No rest between each exercise, and now you're doing ten sets of that. Mm. 10 sets like intervals like interval training but no rest between the sets so it's very much like a hybrid workout in a sense of you're kind of pushing weight because you're moving your own body but you're also doing cardio at the same time yeah so it's almost yeah it's cardio it's the whole muscular endurance mm. and it's but from that point once you've done the 10 sets it's then straight over to the tractor tire because you've got to now right. build up the durability and mm. your inner core strength 
especially from Mongolia, when my uncle dropped me off a tractor tire and a sledgehammer, I had my parents back garden to training, you know, no gym membership. I was flipping the tractor tire. I was beating it with a sledgehammer. I was doing a lot of leg work, you know, jumping on the box, slap squats, going all the way down, all the way up. Abs was various sit-ups. And then you've got the pull-ups, the dips, and then you've got all of the weight training as well, because I think that's still important. And then on top of that, you've got the outdoor work. So that could be running with ankle weights or weighted vests to replicate the weight that you'll be carrying of the rucksack or training a whole three hours because that workout in the garden before Mongolia would take three hours each day, Jeez. every day with no rest day because I didn't believe the desert would give me any rest. And then Fair. on top of that, I would dehydrate myself because it was three hours of training, and whether it was summer or winter, I would try to deprive myself of water because the Gobi Desert wouldn't allow me to do So you're conditioning yourself. I'm really trying to get my body as familiar to certain aspects that I'll face in the desert as I possibly can. And may, you know, maybe that, that helped to save my life. It also helped that I was training in Thailand before I moved back to, because I was training in 35, 40 degrees Celsius. And the instructors would push you out from under the shelter into the sun. So you'd be skipping, you're doing your push-ups, you're doing your pad work under direct sunlight as well. So that probably helped save my life where I did almost die. It is insane. Yeah, that's mental. It's like going to your, like, imagine him being a PT and he's going, yeah, we're going to uh, progressively overload dehydration this week. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> you wouldn't hear it, would you? Is that, you know. is that in the split? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you just wouldn't hear it. So what I do, I don't really recommend and it's taken me a while to put out fitness up but i think i will release the plans it will be like a mongolia training plan madagascar training plan mission yangtze training plan um but it won't be a case of like starve four, yourself four or, sets of dehydration yeah no we want to work on sleep deprivation go one day with no sleep and yeah. then do the same thing it won't be that but effectively the vietnam cycle i had experienced severe sleep deprivation as well so I think a lot of it, people try to say, oh, you lucky bugger. But I think a lot of what I have faced in the desert, Madag in Madagascar and the Yangtze, I have kind of faced in the past anyway on all of the previous adventures from 19 mm. onwards. Because I would just be fascinated with pushing the human body with mobility, with movement. I would see how far it could go, you know, with... And even, I know that the altitude training mass, there's a big myth of, around like whether that even works or not. Let's say it doesn't work. And I'm now training for Mission Yangtze for high altitude, similar altitude it was to Mount Everest base camp. But now I'm training at sea level in North Wales. Even if it doesn't help build lung capacity, for three hours of training, strapping that thing to your face is severely uncomfortable. And now that's where it mm. helps me mentally. Yeah. So regardless of it actually helping my lungs, it's making the session so much harder. And by making it harder, it's preparing me more mentally for when I am doing the Understand, anyway. yeah. You like putting calluses on your mind. Almost. Exactly. Yeah. A hundred percent. It is that it's pushing your body to such disgusting levels that when you're out on the Yangtze, you want to not face those disgusting levels that you're like, oh, okay, this is actually easier than it, I expected. Yeah, mm. because your expectations were ridiculously high. You know, yeah. so actually I'm not dehydrated because I'm following a river. So there's always water. Yes, but that's also because you were training and your body is familiar with exercising extensively without water. Yeah, So it's just giving yourself little vantage points to help you successfully. It's all about the sense. It's all about the inches, right? Yeah. Mm. It's all about the inches and you never know how you're going to adapt. Like I had a UK photographer flown out to me in China and I was buzzing. He was going to join me for three weeks. He lasted six hours on day one and was sent back to the UK That's mad. after flying, I think it was like 20 something hours to try to get to me longer, maybe 30 Why something. did he tap out? A landslide that he right. couldn't overcome. So you never know what's going to happen. He could have never predicted that the landslide would send him home. It was a landslide and it had fallen completely into the river. It was massive. It would add an extra two-day detour if we tried to work our way around. Right. But I saw two clear paths that I was comfortable with overcoming. But now this is where he needed to tell me what his capabilities are. And so I shown him the two routes. I said, I'm going to leave you alone for five to ten minutes. Get rid of all ego and pride. If you're halfway across 
this landslide based on ego, I'll know, you'll know. But unfortunately, at that point, it might be too late. So just spend time, whatever you decide is your decision. And I left him. And 10 minutes after he scouted if he could overcome one or, one or the other, he came back and he says, I, I don't think I could, which was the right decision. He had a daughter, a, a wife at home. Right, yeah. You know, not worth the risk. And he's a photographer. It's just like me trying to dabble and say, I can professionally shoot this wedding. I'm not even a photographer, you know? It's like, yeah, of no. course. Yeah, he's out his comfort So zone, he's really. in my field now. So that's yeah. why I couldn't, because I genuinely didn't know what he can and can't do. Um, and I think that was the best way to go about it. And the right decision, because if he slipped, he's straight down into the yeah, 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 gone. Straight across, yeah. And I remember even crossing. I didn't even think, so that caught me off guard. I remember crossing my head just a, like a golf ball go right past my head and it was still rocks falling from the top, building momentum. This must have been this big and it Jeez. whizzed about a metre or two away from me. Knock you clean out. Oh, it, it would, have, you, it would it? have broke my skull and I would have just rolled into the Yangtze unconscious, dead, gone. Martin couldn't get me because the flow of the river would gone take me down. Wind. So I was like, he made that right choice. But that's why, I mean, you never know what's going to, What's going to get How do you get over that fear of the unexpected? Because obviously you, you you can kind of know what's coming up. Like you talk about trying to starve yourself at home and dehydrate yourself at home because you know you're going to be experiencing that. How do you overcome the unexpected? If you just got to have your wits about you sort of thing? Yeah, there's there's so much is, is based on situational awareness. Mm. It's just being so aware of your surroundings and everything that can and could happen at any moment when you're least expecting it, that I think through all of the sort of awareness that you have on these expeditions, you're only ever then building up your experience. And so when something goes wrong, you're able to then draw on pre uh, previous experience. Right. And so you're never really in uncharted terrain mentally. You, you're, you're constantly like, analysing. Yeah, <laughs> you're kind of like, I've been here before. Different, but the same. And, yeah. and that's what I hope will help me with Serena. It's not the desert and it's not the Malagasy jungle. It's the Amazon rainforest. And so certain things that happen, whilst I won't know exact the same sort of familiarity because I've not faced that before. So there will be, there won't be the, the familiar aspect to it. It will be a point of I have faced similar in a different way. And now I need to draw on that difference to help me conquer whatever it is mm. that I face in Serena. It's like the human adaptation. Obviously, if you put yourself in that situation so much at first, you're going to have to concentrate and put get your wits about you. But for yeah. example, if I put it in perspective to you, for how many years you've done Premier Pro, if I go on, try and edit, I go on, try and edit, edit a video, I'm using so much mental strain to try to do what Alex does yeah. second nature because he's done it for so, so long. Yeah. So to you, you're wasting almost no energy on whizzing about doing all these edits and this, that and the other. Muscle Ash's, Ash's, knows Ash, it all yeah. through yeah. pure yeah. experience, yeah. repetition. Yeah. Ash, yeah. Ash has put himself in that situ situation so many times where he knows this could happen, this could happen, this could happen. Yeah. And you're not putting as much mental power yeah. towards it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Been there so 100%. Many times. Mm. It's exactly like that. And it's like that with every industry. So yeah. for the audience, if they're listening, you know, it yeah. is. It, and it's the same, it's similar to, uh, so I've got Jacob, my content creator, who's filming this Suriname trip. I've got him into my training routine because I want him not to be evacuated. I want him to stay the course. But also Muay Thai, we're also training him in a bit of Muay Thai in MMA den in Battersea. And it's for that sake. It's for, and you'll, have you done any martial arts yourself? No, no, I haven't. So with martial arts, you'll work yourself to such a point that you then stop making mistakes, but then you'll get punished. And so you've got to keep your arms up. You're on the pads, you're working or sparring someone. And the second you drop, get whacked. you get whacked. So yeah. it's almost, and that's what I want Jacob to have. I want him to be at a point where he's so exhausted that he's still able to not make mistakes when he's out there. So when he's in training MMA and he's dropping his hands because of exhaustion, he gets hit by it. I'm like, that's the snake. That's yeah. the croc because you're tired and you're not thinking because your awareness you're is now slotted. It. You're going to get tagged. And so it's, it's, you know what I mean, yeah. right? It's mm. that, that awareness that you've got to keep hold to keep to a hundred percent as best as you can, even when you are. Yeah. And you're exert and you just want to fall flat on your face and drop your hands. You can't. What do you tell yourself internally when you are dehydrated and you think, if I if I let go now and turn off for even half a second, something could happen? What do you say to yourself in your mind? I, I try to remind myself why I'm here. 
why I started, that I expected this. I then also start thinking about those people back at home who believed in me, mm. believed in my preparation. So in the Gobi Desert, was this, I've faced many near deaths, like malaria was one, but in the Gobi Desert, that was so severe that when I reached that unconfirmed water source that I was telling you about at the start of the podcast, it was dry. And now I was at such a des- desperate point, I had four days to make it to the next water source. Now, I had missed the point of pickup from my guide in the city that would have taken at least four to five days to get me to get to me and another couple of days to get me out. I did not believe I would survive six days, but I did believe I could maybe survive four days. And I knew that the water source was four days away, the confirmed water source. Mm. And so I could now at this point, I was delirious. I was hallucinating. I could almost feel my organs drying up. I was in a very desperate way. I would hide under my trailer and I found myself hiding for a good 45 minutes to an hour. And I knew that I'm now turning this four day away water source to five days away, the longer that I rest. Mm. And I started feeling sorry for myself. I started feeling bad for my family. I started believing that this is it. I'm going to die in the Gobi Desert. But there was something else internally that this, that made me focus on the only option that I had, which was to survive. It was like dying's going to happen anyway if I don't do anything about it, which I'm not going to do. The only thing that I can do is survive. And what I did is I broke this. I've always been a big believer of like law of attraction, visualization. I broke this seemingly impossible goal of four days. If you could just picture the pain, no breeze, no shelter, 40 plus degrees, severely dehydrated for weeks on end. The water source is dry and you don't think you'll be able to survive four days. That's where I was at. And so with the delirium and with me hallucinating, seeing things, using map and compass still, still had to make the right decisions, still had to try to motivate myself, still had to follow the small track that I was on, which was my lifeline to the next water source, still had to walk during the day, not at night when it was colder, because at night you could stand on the back end of a snake or you could lose the lifeline to the next water source. Mm. It's very hard to see path. And I broke it down 100 meters rest for five minutes under my trailer because that's all as I could imagine uh, manage at this point. 100 meters, five minute rest, 100 meters, five minute rest. And I did that for four days till I just about made it to that water source. Do you think that structure helped? 100%. I think thinking of four days, I couldn't even think of the next hour. Jeez, yeah. I, like, I was in, Puts I, it in perspective. I will never be able to explain the pain and especially because of the heat. With hypothermia, you get to a point where everything starts to become a little bit numb. And then all victims of hypothermia have been found with their hats and gloves off because they believe they're hot and then they want to go for a sleep. And then that's it. Semi-peaceful death, hallucinating, gone. In the heat, you feel everything. You feel every second of pain. Mm. Like almost scratching on the desert floor with your finger to try to get through. It didn't get to that point, but it got to a point where I was... 50-50, 50-50, if not 60-40, confident that I'm going to die out here in the middle of the Gobi Desert. And that was the biggest, that was terrifying. And like even when I arrived, it took me eight days to recover. Stayed at that water source, didn't want to leave its side. And there were locals there, mm. just rested. I stayed there and I would have these nightmares. And then one minute I was sweating, next minute I couldn't sweat. Uh, I couldn't even get up and go outside to use the toilet so instead I had this big sort of empty bottle that I would fill up and I remember it being a little bit black which meant that I was pissing out um, dead blood cells Yeah, and then eventually I could see this bottle I was still filling it through the night kept waking up every hour to week so I was trying to drink so much water which is also dangerous and it was becoming less and less blacky reddy orange it was becoming better I started physically feeling better I had signal my family and friends were shit scared. They're now worrying, saying, come home. But I knew I was in a safe place. And I knew that I had made it past the point where the previous guy called for evacuation. Why give up now? I believed I was past the hardest point of the trip. And because of that, I'm now in the chance of doing what no one's ever done Gave you a spark of motivation. Gave me that spark. I said, I promise you I will stay here until I'm 100% again. But I don't think it's right for me to leave. I quit now even though I had almost died. But, um, and I did, and I felt myself get 95%. I was better. And that's the closest you've come to dying. I think, I think that or malaria. Right, yeah. Malaria yeah, yeah. was really bad where I, 
I rocked up. I was suffering with falciparum, which is the deadliest strain. The deadliest strain usually kills you within 24 hours. But if you, if you catch it within 24 hours, you can eradicate it out of your system. So I no longer have malaria. However, there's three strains that remain dormant. They're lower. They right. won't, they're not necessarily dead. Can kill you. They remain do it. They'll, they'll be inside you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Rear their ugly head every few years. Mm. And I didn't know what I had. And for five days, I was walking with falciparum because I was taking my anti malaria pills. But because I'd eaten rotten eel from a community that was suffering from the bubonic plague, they said, <laughs> Eat what we give you, stay inside your tent. You can't come out because we're suffering. We listened to them. Although I was out of respect, I wanted to leave the village and like, like leave them to it. They just lost a few relatives. But my guide said, no, it's fine. They really don't mind staying here. We ate the rice and eel. The eel smelled pretty funky, but we were hungry. The next few days we were vomiting, a bit of food poisoning, vomiting, diarrhea. So these anti-malaria pills, although they cover you about 80%, were going in one way, out the other. Didn't have my full dose protecting me, but mm. enough that I didn't die within a day. So for five days I was walking, not knowing what it is, managed to reach a community that had overland transport, got myself straight to the city, went into a hotel. At this point, I collapsed on the bed. I don't really remember much. I just remember like three heads spinning above me, three doctors. It was all blurry. She took my blood. She tried to sit me up. She came back minutes later and that's when she said, like, you've got false support. It was all broken English because she was French. Yeah. Malagasy French. And I didn't really know what she was trying to tell me but I do remember her saying something about dead dying death deadliest and, oh I, my God. I, and I was just like what 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 do you mean huh you know back and forth and then I had insurance for this one which was nice and so I called them and they were able to translate and what she was saying is had I have arrived potentially three hours later than when I arrived I would have potentially slipped into a coma she was trying to say, oh my God. you were so close to death. It's unreal. And I just got like day, dying death. I was mm. like, what do you mean? Like deadliest strain? What, what, what is it? And then I realized, yeah, they explained it properly. Yeah, false upora. You would have died. And I was only one month into a five-month expedition. And I lost 13 kilograms in, one, in month one. Get the worst bits out of the way at the start. Then. <laughs> <laughs> so that was also, there's been a lot of hairy moments, but those two are the big ones. Another time where I almost lost my photographer, probably that was the scariest because it was someone else's life on my journey. But, um, but I've never made the same mistake twice, lads. Yeah. <laughs> and you're still here today. Yeah, I'm still here. Um, so one question that slipped past, the, <laughs> yeah. the Vietnam, uh, did you, was it the Ho Chi Minh Trail that you did on the bike or? What was that? Is that the north to south? Did you say you... Oh, is that like just one straight road? The Yeah. Yeah, I guess that's what it would be. Yeah, that's, We that... took like the main road from... Yeah, the Ho Chi Minh Trail. I want, yeah, I want to do that okay. on a motorbike, maybe not on a push bike. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, did, I did 100 miles last month for charity on a bike and that is, yeah. that's as long as I'm going to do now. With two gears? Oh, actually, yeah. My, <laughs> yeah. My, as I took the first pedal, my sprocket broke on the front, so I literally had two <sighs> gears the whole way. How long did it take? seven hours i think okay yeah, yeah. got but, it done uh, that, that was it that yeah. was that's my longest stint for yeah but he that, says long you'll, you'll end up doing another one you'll be like i, I, I quite fancy half one. iron man once i'm healed yeah um but i saw someone did a full one in antarctica did you see that i didn't that someone did it a, a full iron man in a, antarctica and yeah that was i watched the video and i thought that is insane so the iron man what does that that's not like it's the triathlon is that swimming and yeah 100 mile bike yeah Marathon, 26 miles. And then yeah. I th think it might be two miles in the water. In Antarctica. And yeah. It was in, I, wa I watched that thought. That's insane. I think it took him days, like yeah. days to complete. But like, who was that? Who was that that did that? Oh, you know. It, it was only, I'm sure it was only recent. Yeah. Um, Antarctica. Because I might, I might know him. Is it, um, it's not the guy uh, that called, did a marathon in every continent. Uh, and Anders Hoffman, I think. Um, so we'll quickly just reflect on what was the experience like on the Joe Rogan podcast. On um, Joe got, Rogan we've experience. Got, we've, got know, we've got to know this. Hey, what, it was great, man. You is know, he mythical? It was quite a while he, ago, wasn't it? It was 2020. Four right, years okay. Ago. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so that was right before COVID. Yeah. Um, and I got an email back from his agent saying, Hi, Ash, we've run this by Joe Rogan. He's fascinated, really wants you on the podcast. Can you be here in two weeks? It's just like, whoa. 
Yes. Easy yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that yeah. was, I think that was just before Christmas that I received that. It's just like the ultimate Christmas gift, yeah. right? They wanted me to be there on the January the 11th. That's um, so cool, man. Yeah. And then I rocked up. I was with my friend from Wales as well. And yeah, it was like this big sort of, there's no signage. It's kind of like this man cave. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah, in yeah. In LA. It, he's in Texas now, but in LA. And then you rock up and we were like, is this it? Just knock, doom, doom, doom. And then there's two big geezers that open the door. And they were the friendliest. They were like, ah, oh, sure, sure yeah. man. They looked into it, you know, really big. Come on in. And they, they took me around. Um, and then Joe was wrapping up his episode with Joey Diaz. Oh, he's ace. Yeah, yeah so he a... came out. I didn't know Joey Diaz back then. No way. And my friend never lets me live it down. He says that's the world's most wasted handshake because Joey Diaz came out <laughs> and he was like, ah, and then I was like, hey, hey. I'm like, you said hey because you didn't have any idea who he was. Now I know he's a big fucking deal, isn't he? Like one of yeah, Joe Rogan's yeah, best he's, mates. He's ace. Um, but yeah, so Joe then showed me around and it's like, great man. He's got like all his car, well, some of his cars parked there, a gym, pool table his own coffee machine, which he made like a turmeric latte, um, his Unreal. salt bath. And then, yeah, we just connected from the get-go. We then walked into a studio and I didn't even know we were rec recording. We just sort of walked in. That's what we, we would, tried. That's what we tried to do. Yeah, yeah, like that, yeah. And then when he said, so Ash, tell everybody what, you, uh, tell everybody what you've done, I realised, oh. It's recording. on. <laughs> it's on, yeah. <laughs> Lots of um, Did you see the comedy club? No. It's a, it's a different different venue, I think, isn't it? I don't know if it was at the same venue. What the his? Yeah, I Joe's. think he, I think he had, yeah he's got one now called the Mothership, I think, in Texas. But I think he had his own. Ah, uh, kind of okay, beer. yeah, but yeah, he's a nice guy. Yeah, he was really cool. We went. Oh, I think that was two hours forty. But even after that, we were talking for ages. Um, after that as well, I want to try to get back on after Serena would be cool. Yeah, I, for I think sure. He's he's just so like actually in, interested in the people, which is what makes it such yeah. more of an engaging conversation. It's just mm. insane how he's able to dabble in so many topics. Yeah. Like he's talking yeah, I don't about get it. expeditions and sort of different countries around the world with me, and then he's dabbling on AI and technology with Elon Musk, and then he goes to science and vaccinations. You know what I mean? It's just like he's here, there, and everywhere. He's, he's interested though. That's yeah. that's like the thing. It, yeah. I think that's the bill. Interested is interesting. It's one of my yeah. favorite sayings. Mm. Yeah, hundred percent. I like yeah. that. Right. Well, I think we could uh, wrap it up then, Ash. Um, one thing to end on. Yes. What is some advice that you would give to someone who's maybe maybe gotten <laughs> down the same path as you? They've sort of been stuck into the do X, Y, and Z engineering, maths, blah blah blah. Go to uni. How how do you get them to fulfill their dreams and purpose um i would say whatever it is internally that you truly want not your mum and dad not your siblings not your peers surrounding you whatever it is that you want listen to that and go for it otherwise you'll grow with a little bit of resentment had now that you've not gone after it and i would also say that you are far more capable than you give yourself credit for that's something I always used to have a little bit of doubt, a little bit of like, mm, but then I did it and I would always surprise myself. And I think people who have gone down sort of a career path that was big, scary and daunting learn on the job. And what they realize is that they do have the capabilities, even though they do have the fear and the doubt and eradicate that doubt with experience. Start small and fucking build up to achieve it. Amazing. Ash, Good stuff. thanks for the time, mate. Thank really you, appreciate it. Appreciate it.